and welcome to Laugh and Learn with Jungle Jam and the Razzle Flattens. Our first story is called Sully Makes a Friend. Here we go. You know, kindness is a virtue we all need to practice. In fact, as Sully the Aardvark learned, kindness and gentleness are two of the most important things to remember when making new friends. That's for sure. It all began when Mr. Smithers the Zebra and his wife would enjoy their later years playing shuffleboard in a senior community in Florida. Right about that same time, Ancelot the Aardvark and his wife June, along with their darling Aardvark daughter Sally... Hi. She is darling! ...happened to be looking for a new home. You see, just when the Smithers moved out of their home, Ancelot got that promotion he was hoping for. The timing couldn't have been better. They'd been wanting to move into a little nicer area, preferably the better side of the creek. And when the old Smithers house opened up, well, Muffy Bear... That's my wife! ...being the award-winning realtor she is... That's my wife! ...put the two together for a perfect fit. Way to go, hon! Thank you, Gruffy! Even though Ancelot and June were very excited about their new home, Sally, their darling daughter, was sad. I don't have any friends here. Yeah, but you are darling. Thank you. Sally even had to change to a new aardvark school where she didn't know anyone. But there was one bright spot. While walking in the jungle one day, Sally discovered a wonderful swimming hole. Now, Sally had visited many swimming holes in the jungle where she used to live, but not one of them had what this swimming hole had. Wow! A perfect board where she could lie out in the afternoon sun. It's beautiful! So, every afternoon, right after school, Sally ran to the swimming hole to lie out in the sun on the wonderful board. This is living! One day, Sally was lying out on the board when all of a sudden she heard... Um... Do you think you'll be diving soon? Sally looked up. Who are you? Who are you? I'm Sally. I'm Sully. Hi. Hi. Hey, I have a friend named Sally. She's one of the Cheetah Sisters. Oh. So, um, I was wondering if you'll be jumping soon? Jumping? Why would I be jumping? Because you're on my diving board. Your diving board? Yeah. You use it to do really fun things like cannonballs. And then you splash everybody and it's really funny. <laughs> Is it on a diving board? It's not? No. It's a laying out in the sun board. A lying out in the sun board? Of course. I had no idea. All this time I thought it was a diving board. Silly Sally. Sorry, Sally. I hope I didn't wreck it. So, um, what are you doing at my swimming hole on my lying out in the sun? Huh? Don't tell me. It is a swimming hole, isn't it? Well, yes. Whew, that was a close one. Sally explained that she'd been coming to the swimming hole every day for the last two weeks, and she'd never seen him there. That's because I was on vacation. So Sully showed Sally how you could use the lying out in the sunboard as a diving board. <laughs> and the two of them dove and dove and dove and jumped and jumped and jumped and splashed and splashed and splashed, doing cannonball after cannonball after cannonball for the rest of the afternoon for the rest of the afternoon. Oops. Anyway, later that day, as Sully was walking home, he couldn't help but thinking about what a great time he had with Sally. Wow, that sure was fun. As he walked along, he ran into Nozzles the elephant. Glad to have you back, Sully. Not as glad as I am to be back. Oh, I didn't know you missed us so much. It's not that. Oh. I met this girl Aardvark down at the swimming hall. Her name's Sally, but she's not Cheetah Sally. Well, what does she look like? She's furry, and she has a really long nose. She sounds darling. Is this the start of a beautiful friendship? Hmm. Huh. I never thought of that. Friends. Wow. You think she'd go for something like that? Well, sure. The next day, Sully couldn't wait to get to the swimming hole to see his new friend. However, having never had a girl aardvark friend before, he felt a little bit nervous. I sure hope she likes me. She seemed to like me yesterday, but today she might get to know me better. I'd better comb my hair. Sully arrived at the swimming hole before Sally and was glad he would have time to prepare. Immediately, he began to practice his best cannonball. Cannonball! <laughs> She's gonna love this. Sure enough, it wasn't long before Sally appeared. Sally! Sally! Hi! Hi. You're just in time to see my new dive. Why don't you move over to the left a little so you can see better? You mean here? Yeah, that's perfect. Right there. Sully began bouncing up and down on the board, each time getting higher in the air. Then, he bounced as hard as he could and jumped. Cannonball! The flash from Sully's cannonball drenched Sally from head to toe. Said Sally, standing soaking wet. Wasn't that great? <laughs> Here, help me out of the water. Sally reached her hand down for Sully. But just when she did, Whoa! Sully pulled Sally right into the swimming hole. <laughs> Got you good that time. <laughs> Isn't this fun? Sally did not share Sully's excitement. In fact, she didn't like the way Sully was treating her at all. She climbed out of the swimming hole. Sully looked up and noticed she didn't look very happy. Hey, Sally, what's the matter? Nothing. Sully swam over toward her and, trying to cheer her up, cupped his paws together and splashed her once again. 
This is sure fun, huh, Sally? <laughs> I have to go now. Sully noticed that a little tear began to form in Sally's eye. What's the matter? Are you allergic to water? Without a word, Sally disappeared into the trees, heading toward her home. Bye, Sally. I had a good time. Feeling a little confused, Sully climbed out of the water and started to head home. On the way, he met up with his friend Nozzles. Hey, Sully. How's your new friend? Uh, okay, I guess. But I don't think she likes me very much. Why do you think that? Well, I don't know. I splashed her and pulled her into the water and did a big cannonball and got her all wet and stuff. But even so, she still left early. Sounds like you might have been a little rough. What do you mean? Nozzles explained to Sully that he didn't have to splash Sally and push her into the water to get her to like him. There's another way? Well, sure. Why don't you try being more gentle? Gentle? Really? I was going to try pulling her hair and tripping her and things. Well, why don't you try the gentle thing first? Okay, but I don't know if it's going to work. The next day, Sully set off for the swimming hole. Let's see, I shouldn't splash her a lot and I shouldn't pull her into the water. I know what I'll do. I'll stay away from her and let her do whatever she wants. Then she'll like me. Even better, I'll ignore her completely. How could she help but like me? Oh, I wish I'd have thought of this yesterday. Once they both arrived at the swimming hole, Sully set about his new plan. Hi, Sully. <laughs> Sully, are you okay? <laughs> Aren't you going to talk to me? Sally tried and tried, but Sully stuck to his plan. This is really working. She's crazy about me. Goodbye, Sully. <laughs> wow, this is great. She didn't even go home crying. I definitely think we're moving in the right direction. The next morning, Sully could hardly wait to get to the swimming hole to start ignoring his new friend Sally. But much to Sully's disappointment, Sally never showed up. This makes ignoring her nearly impossible. Later that day, Sully ran into nozzles. How are things going with Sally, Sully? Did you try being more gentle? Well, today she didn't even show up. What? What happened yesterday? I ignored her completely. Sully, Sully, Sully... Nozzles explained that Sully just needed to practice a little kindness. I just don't know how to act around her. Eventually, Nozzles convinced Sully that the best way to be Sally's friend was for Sully to just be himself. You think she'll go for that? Yep, and it's the best way to be. Suddenly, Sully and Nozzles heard something in the distance. Help, help! It was Sally. Come on, Nozzles. It sounds like she's by the quicksand pit. Help! Nozzles and Sully ran as fast as they could to the quicksand pit. And, sure enough, there was Sally, sinking deeper and deeper. Sally, what are you doing in the quicksand pit? That could be dangerous. I'm sinking. Well, no wonder. Sully knew that Nozzles would not be able to help much because he was so heavy and he would sink faster than Sally. I'll just uh, stand back here. Sully grabbed hold of a vine and reached out across the quicksand as far as he could to Sally. Grab my hand. Sully pulled with all his might. <laughs> Nozzles the elephant wrapped his trunk around Sully's waist and helped him pull. Ah. Hang on, Sally. Slowly, inch by inch, Sally began coming out of the sand. Ah. Soon, she was on solid ground. Thank you, Sully. You saved my life. What are you doing out here? Sally explained she was looking for a new place to lie out in the sun. What's the matter with the lying out in the sun board? I didn't think you wanted me around. Of course I want you around. Sully apologized for being so rough and then ignoring her altogether. He explained what he really wanted all along was to be her friend. Silly, Sully. Sorry, Sally. Let's go back to our swimming hole. We can wash off the sand and lie out in the sun and maybe do a little diving. Our swimming hole? Of course. It wouldn't be the same without you. And that day, Sully learned the importance of kindness and that the best way to be a friend is to just be yourself. Because that's the best way to be. <laughs> that was fun, but we're just getting started. Our next story is titled, Hermie the Love Bug. Here we go. You know, a big part of kindness is accepting others even if they don't look the same as we do. And that's a lesson Gruffy Bear learned in a rather unusual way. It all started when a little bug named Hermie, who had never been to this part of the jungle, was having the time of his life enjoying the beautiful sunshine. <laughs> as Hermie was flying along doing flips and somersaults in the air, he noticed in the distance a bear, Gruffy Bear. Huh? He flew on ahead to get a closer look. Wow! At first, Hermie was amazed at Gruffy's strength as Gruffy moved some huge fallen logs. Unbelievable! Then, when Gruffy started humming, Hermie couldn't believe his ears. Dum, 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 dum. Hey, what a catchy tune. This is without question the absolutely most greatest bear I've ever seen. Hermie went on watching for hours, and he noticed Gruffy was a very friendly bear. Bear hug. Give your neighbor a bear hug. Hermie couldn't get over how interesting Gruffy was. Boy, I'd sure like to meet that bear. We'd be great friends. Like Gleason and Norton, Yogi and Boo Boo, Andy Griffith and Aunt Bee. 
this is one fantastic bear! Hermie flew closer to Gruffy. Then he realized... Wait a minute. What am I thinking? Hermie was a little worried that Gruffy might not want to be his friend because... Well, well Hermie was a... Well, a... A bug! Hey, get out of here, you! Hi, Mr. Bear! Go on, shoot! My name is... Where's that bug swatter? Hermie! Muffy! I'm not just a bug. I'm a green lacewing! Yes, Gruffy, dear? Where's that bug repellent? We got bugs out here! I think it's in the shed, Gruffy. Bugs in the jungle. There goes the neighborhood. Perhaps this isn't a good time. All right, let's see. Bug repellent, bug repellent. Where are you? You're gonna find things when you want... Ah, here we are! Well, I had long goodbyes, so I'll come back when you're feeling better. Bye! And with that, Hermie flew off. On his way back home, he passed a bunch of praying mantises. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Hey guys, would you put in a good word for me? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Please help Hermie, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The next morning, Hermie woke up and he couldn't help thinking about Gruffy Bear. I sure would like to meet that bear. I'll bet we could be great friends. He tried to figure out what went wrong the first time he tried to get to know Gruffy. Maybe I came on too strong. That's it. I was just rushing things because I was so excited. Hermie, I just have to relax. And set off on his journey. As Hermie approached Gruffy's house, he could see that Gruffy and his family were having a picnic on their front lawn. What a lovely family! That bear is just the greatest! Anybody who'd have a picnic with his family, I'm sure would love to meet a friendly bug like me! Hermie confidently flew over to Gruffy with his head held high. Hi there, wonderful bear! My name is... Bugs! Again! Wouldn't you know it! You try to have a peaceful, bug-free afternoon picnic with your family in the jungle. Excuse me? Honey, do we still have that deep jungle buzz-off bug repellent? Pardon me, I'd just like to say that... It should be in the shed where you left it yesterday. I wanted to tell you that... All right, guard my food. We'll let this character know he wasn't invited to our picnic. I'm probably interrupting. I'll come back another time. Hermie headed back home. Who knew the picnic was by invitation only? He was more than a little frustrated with himself. What was I thinking? He was spending quality time with his family. Makes you like him all the more, doesn't it? I'm sure when he has the opportunity and the timing's just right, things will be different. We're going to be the best of friends soon. I just know it. That night, Hermie was so excited about trying again tomorrow, he could hardly get to sleep. Tomorrow's the day. Yes, sir, I just know it. Tomorrow, the friendship of a lifetime will begin. It's like Hope and Crosby, the Lone Ranger in Tonto, Andy Griffith and Barney Fife. All right, more like Hope and Crosby. Finally, Hermie fell asleep. <laughs> Okay, Hermie, my buddy, try it again. Dum da dum dum dum. Dum da dum. That's where I get lost. That's all right. Just keep practicing. You've almost got it. Hey, would you like some lemonade? Like some? I'd love some. Gruffy, you're the best friend I ever had. Well, thank you. You're very special too. Hey, what do you say we go fishing? Just you and me in the sunshine. Uh, I've never really tried before. You can do it. It's way easier than singing, and you've almost got that down. Dum da dum. Hmm. Maybe you're right. Well, what are we waiting for? We've got fishing to do! Now you're talking! On the way, we'll try a little easier song. It goes like this. Bear hug. Give your neighbor a bear hug. You try. Okay. Um, what, what's the middle part again? Neighbor. It's, take your time. We've got all day, my little friend. <laughs> yeah, good thing. Ah, Hermie, what a pair we are. Like cake and ice cream, cookies and milk, liver and onions. All right, more like the Lone Ranger and Tonto. But you're the best friend a bear could ever have. You're the best friend a bear could ever have. A bear could ever have. A bear could ever have. Huh? What? Oh, I must have been dreaming. Hermie looked around. The sun was just peeking up over the horizon. Oh boy, I better get going. After all, it's Hermie and Gruffy Day. We've got fishing to do. So, Hermie flew off down the trail, heading straight for Gruffy's house. <coughs> He was so excited that as he flew through the air, he did flips and somersaults and began to sing. Bug hug! Give your neighbor a bug hug! I did it! Hey, Gruffy! Ha <laughs> ha! This is great! Bug hug! It, what was that middle part again? Oh, boy. As Hermie came closer to Gruffy's house, he couldn't believe his eyes. Gruffy was preparing to go fishing. It's going to be just like my dream! Uh-oh! I guess it's time to turn over the tape. See you on the other side. <laughs> Okay, okay, this is it. Now just relax and say good morning. Yeah, that'll work. Here goes. Hermie approached Gruffy with a big smile on his face, and Gruffy stood up. This is a beautiful day. I couldn't agree more. Gruffy? Well, I've got fishing to do. Gruffy picked up his fishing pole and began to walk off. Dum, da dum, dum, dum. Alone. Hermie couldn't believe his little eyes. But, wait, it's, it's Hermie and Gruffy Day. I had the whole day planned. He didn't even see me. I can't believe he didn't even see me. Hermie sat down on a nearby stump. He tried to cheer himself up. Then again, he didn't shoo me away. 
That's a step in the right direction. Although, it was probably because you didn't see me. She began to cry. This is the worst day of my life. Just then, Gruffy, realizing he'd forgotten his lemonade, came back. And when he did, he heard something that sounded like a bug crying. Although he'd never really heard a bug crying before, the sound of anyone crying always made Gruffy feel bad. He looked down at the little stump and saw Hermie. Hey, what's the matter, little fella? You look like you lost your best friend. Gruffy sat down. Hermie was so sad, he didn't even look up to see who was talking to him. I did. Sort of. Well, he's really more like someone who wouldn't know me from any other bug on a log. We were supposed to meet each other and go fishing and singing and drinking lemonade together. Wow, you bugs lead quite the life. I was going fishing, and I planned on having a little lemonade, but I hadn't even thought about doing any singing. Just then, Hermie looked up and saw he was sitting right next to Gruffy Bear. Gruffy? In the fur. Hey, how do you know my name? I've been watching you for days. I wanted to meet you, but every time I tried, you shooed me away. Well, I, I must say I didn't know you enjoyed fishing and lemonade and singing. Wow, that's icing on the cake. Before now, I probably just thought you were another bug on a log. Yes, but I'm a very nice bug on a log. Friendly, fun-loving? Who knew that bugs could be friendly and fun-loving? I should have invited you to my picnic. And you seem like a really nice, friendly bear. That's why I thought we could be great friends. Like Andy Griffith and Floyd the Barber, Fred Flintstone and Barney Rebel, Charlie Chaplin and... Well, maybe more like Fred Flintstone and Barney Rebel. Well, you are a friendly little guy. Gruffy realized he hadn't been very loving to the little bug. And he also learned an important lesson about not judging others by the way they look. Sorry about that old bug repellent thing. Hey, what do you say we go fishing? Just you and me in the sunshine. You mean it? Sure, I can rig you up a pole. I got a toothpick around here somewhere. Wow. And while we're at it, we'll do a little singing. This is the best day of my life. And so, with fishing poles and lemonade in hand, Gruffy and Hermie walked off toward the fishing hole together. And as they walked and talked, they knew they would become the best of friends. Like Lewis and Martin. Like Laurel and Hardy. Like Andy and Opie. Exactly. jungle, some of the biggest problems happen just because of a little mix-up. Take the other day, for example. Gruffy Bear decided to get up earlier than usual and leave the little clearing where all the animals live. Well, I didn't just decide. I actually heard the call of the wild. You mean you had to follow those deep primal urges inside you? No, no. I, I mean, I got a phone call from my friend, Wild. Yeah, he wants me to come over and help him do a little fort building. <laughs> oh, well... He's a rabbit. Uh, I see. <laughs> anyway... A uh, jackrabbit, in fact. That's nice. Now... Uh, his name isn't Jack, though. Uh, I, I didn't think it was. No, no, it, uh, it's Wild. That's his name. Uh, Gruffy? Although Wild is an unusual name. Gruffy? But I didn't name him. <laughs> uh, Gruffy? Oh, boy, look at the time. Listen, I'd love to stay and chat, but i got to be clear on the other side of the jungle. <laughs> you narrators, you'd love to talk our legs off, don't you? Listen, i got to go. Bye. And so he strapped on his tool belt. Never leave home without it. And off he went. The only problem was he left a little before everyone else got up. And he didn't tell anyone where he was going, so when all the other animals woke up a little later, they naturally wondered. Hey! Where's Gruffy? Then they immediately did the first thing you should do when someone is missing. Eat breakfast! No. Play badminton? Uh, no. Form a glee club? No. You, you, you start a search party. Oh. Great idea. I love parties. Although glee clubs are fun. They looked in Gruffy's cave. Hello. Hello. By his favorite scratching tree. No wonder he likes this. Ooh, ooh, a little lower. To the left. Ah. At the lake. Cannonball! And all of the other places they knew Gruffy liked to go. Pick up two pepperoni pizzas. Hold the anchovies. The bowling alley. I love to wear these shoes. The museum. I think the Da Vinci goes better with Monet, don't you? Only if the light's right. They searched for him all morning long, but Gruffy was nowhere to be found. They were wondering what to do next when Nozzles came up with an idea. Why don't we all go back to the clearing? I'm sure Gruffy will show up sooner or later. Great idea! My feet were starting to hurt anyway. Love those shoes, though! Monet is overrated. So that's what they did. Well, most of them. Jean-Claude the Flying Squirrel refused to give up. Besides, there is a good wind today. Jean-Claude took off, jumping from tree to tree at blinding speeds. <laughs> Meanwhile, in another part of the jungle, his morning's visit with his friend Wild. He's a jackrabbit, you know. He was making his way through a rather tangled thicket when suddenly... <laughs> it was a strange, eerie howling sound that made Gruffy stop right in his tracks. Whoa! What a strange, eerie howling sound! And it made me stop right in my tracks! <laughs> oh, 
there it is again. Boy, if this keeps up, I'm never going to get anywhere. I'd better go check it out. He pushed his way through the thicket in the direction of the strange, eerie howling sound. It led him to a narrow path, and on the path was the source of the noise. A large beast covered with thick red fur, wearing a bowler cap, a green vest, and white spats. Nice spats! One of his feet was caught in a vine, and there were dozens of white sticks all around him. He was lying on the ground, crying out. What's the matter, fellow? <laughs> oh, at last, an angel of mercy. Where? Never mind. Could you help me out, please, lad? What's the problem? Well, I was carrying this load of sticks, and I couldn't see where I was going, and I got my foot caught in this vine, and I tripped, and now I've fallen, and I can't get off. Well, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> well, well, here, let me help you out. Uh, uh, oh, oh, lovely. Thank you, thank you so much. And whom do I have the pleasure of addressing? Huh? What's your name, lad? Oh, Gruffy. Oh, Gruffy, is it? Well, imagine that. Who'd have thought I'd meet another Irishman all the way out here in the wilderness? No, no, not not old Gruffy. I'm just plain old Gruffy. <laughs> well, I can see that, but what's your name? Yeah, uh, Gruffy Bear. And a fine name it is, too. Thank you. My name is Ote, Koi Ote. I'm an Irish wolfhound. A hound, huh? Well, what are you doing with all these sticks? Did you fetch them? <laughs> <laughs> it is quite a sense of humor you have. Yeah, I do? Never mind. I have these sticks because I'm wanting to build a little fence around the mouth of me cave, but they're awfully hard to handle. Well, that's because they're all loose. Here, uh, let me use my tool belt here. <clears throat> Tie them up in a bundle and we'll carry them to your cave together. How's that? Oh, that's very nice of you, lad. And a capital suggestion it is, too. And that's what they did. Coyote... Uh, koi. A coyote's cave was just around the bend in the path, so they got there in no time. Ah, here we are. Just set the sticks down anywhere. All right, right here be fine, I guess. <clears throat> ah, that's grand. Now, would you care to join me inside for a bit of liquid refreshment? Ah, uh, no, but I sure would like something to drink if you have it. That's even better. Come on inside, then. Thanks. What they didn't know was that as soon as they went inside the cave, Jean-Claude the Flying Squirrel came zipping up on the treetops just outside. He also had heard the strange, eerie howling sound coming from Coyote. Oh, that's Koi. Uh, Coyote. I haven't heard a noise like that since Nuzzo's last head curled. His sharp eyes scanned the area around the front of the cave, and then he saw it. Gruffy's bright red tube belt, tied around a bundle of white sticks. He started to get a closer look when suddenly, out of the cave, came the strangest-looking creature he'd ever seen. Can't have Graffy for dinner without having some figs for dessert. Jean-Claude couldn't believe his ears. Graffy for dinner? And with figs? Jean-Claude leaned forward to get a better view, and when he did, he stepped on a weak branch that snapped. It fell from the tree and landed right in front of the creature. Jean-Claude froze, and the creature looked around in surprise. Now I wonder what made that happen. Jean-Claude barely breathed. Finally, after what seemed like hours, the creature shrugged, picked a few more figs, and went back inside the cave. Jean-Claude the squirrel nearly fainted with relief. Oh, I must tell the others. He turned around and sped back to the little clearing as fast as he could. Assistance! Assistance! Everyone come here! You'll never guess what they have seen with these very own eyes. Jean-Claude, what's going on? What's going on here? What's up? What is it? Well, just calm down, Jean-Claude, and tell us all about it. And so he did. Unfortunately, Jean-Claude was so frightened by his experience and so panicked by the run home that some of the facts of the story got a little out of hand. Oh, la la! For instance, the strange creature grew into... A monster in the jungle? Hey, we make the feet! Monster? Monster? Are you sure? Monster? 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 The white sticks became... Bones! Bones! Big stick of bones! bones. I I stick of bones. bones. Someone's lost their bones! Bones? bones. 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 No, not bones. And the eerie howling sound, worse than my head cold. Well, now, wait a minute. This news set the animals into a tizzy. They didn't know what to think, or what to do, for that matter. But things got really out of hand when Jean-Claude told them... He said he was going to have Graffy for dinner, along with some figs. No! I like figs. Maybe it's a different Graffy. I'm afraid not, because wrapped around this sack of bones was Graffy's bright red tool belt. <gasps> oh! Hold it, hold it, hold it. Jean-Claude, are you sure it was Graffy's bright red tool belt? But of course. We should go get this creature before he comes to get the rest of us. Yeah, 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 y
How do we know he's a monster? Yeah, yeah, how do we know? Yeah, how do we, know? Yeah. we don't want his kind here. Yeah. Yeah. We, go. Go. We, go. we need to keep our homes safe. Yeah. 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 Come on, everyone, follow me! Wait, everybody, wait a minute, please! But it was too late. They had all taken off to rid their jungle of the monster. Nozzles shook his head sadly and followed. I got a bad feeling about this. Jean-Claude led them directly to the cave. They were all very nervous, but they knew what they had to do. They snuck up quietly and surrounded the opening. Ow! 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 Watch out! Hey, keep it down, very guys. Quiet. Then Jean-Claude took a deep breath and said, All right, man, still. We know you're in there. Now come on out. Then there was a loud stirring in the cave. Stirring? Did you hear that? He's stirring. He's too late. We're too late. We're grumpy. We're stirring Everyone held their breath. <gasps> they began to hear more sounds. It was the monster coming closer. Oh, no. He's stirring! Hey, guys! Gruffy! Gruffy! What's going on? You're alive. You're safe. Where have you been all day? Well, this morning I went to visit my friend Wild. He's a jackrabbit, you know. What about this afternoon? Well, I was visiting with a new friend. Hey, Coy, come on out here. Yes, Gruffy, what is it? The monster! Ah! Hold it, hold it! This isn't a monster. This is my new friend. Coyote, at your service. Jean-Claude looked up. Friend? Then why was he making all those strange noises? Yeah, yeah. what about the How about noise? those noises? What about noises? Noises? Yeah. yeah! Oh, you mean when I fell and I couldn't get up? His foot was caught in a vine. Very painful it was, too, until Gruffy got me out. Ooh, yeah! Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah but what about the stack of bones? Bones? Yeah. The ones you tied up with Gruffy's tool belt. Those aren't bones. They're sticks. I'm wanting to build a fence around the mouth of me cave. He's wanting to build a fence around the mouth of his cave. Oh! oh. 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 What's so funny? We all thought you were some sort of monster. A monster? Uh -huh. Me? Here a new neighbor moves into our jungle, and instead of getting to know him, we all think the worst of him. I'm sorry, Mr. Rote. Sorry! Yeah. Yeah. I'm really sorry. Think nothing of it. Tis past and forgotten. Now, would you all be joining Graffy and me for a spot of tea? Okay. Okay. So the animals learn never to jump to conclusions. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Where are my manners? I can't believe it. Here we got a new neighbor in town, and I haven't even given him a bear hug yet. Come here, you. Give me that headache. <laughs> <laughs> for joining us for Lock and Learn. Hope you come back again soon for more fun with Jungle Jam and the Rifle Flatters. Bye-bye. Hi, and welcome to Lock and Learn with Jungle Jam and the Rifle Flabbins. Our first story is called Pogo a Go Go. Here we go. You know, getting new stuff, like a toy, is always fun. But sometimes when we get new things, it's easy to forget about the importance of sharing, which is what happened to Jean-Claude the Flying Squirrel. Then moi! Jean-Claude's new prized possession was something really special. A BTFP pogo stick, limited edition. BTFP? Bouncy, trouncy, flouncy, pouncy. Oh, bouncy, mouncy, uh, I'm sorry, bouncy, nouncy... Uh, that is, uh, bouncy... That is why we call it BTFB. Yes, well, anyway, getting a BTFP pogo stick... Limited edition. Uh, limited edition. It was no easy task. First, Jean-Claude had to send in 540 box tops from his favorite cereal. Nutty Coated Nut Brands, the breakfast of squirrels. Then he had to wait 68 weeks for delivery. It was the longest 68 weeks it arrived. Oh, joy, oh, joy, it is here. Jean-Claude loved his BTFP. Limited, let's watch that. Uh, limited. And he spent nearly every waking moment experiencing new kinds of bouncing fun on it. Up, down, up, down. The variations never cease. The other animals noticed how much fun Jean-Claude was having, and they were very happy for him. Have you noticed how much fun Jean-Claude is having? Yeah, I'm really happy for him. Really happy? Yeah, Wait, yeah. Yeah. Couldn't be happier. He's beautiful. And as Jean-Claude bounced by, they would all laugh and have a wonderful time, which was all well and good, except for one thing. Not only did the other animals notice how much fun Jean-Claude was having, Jean-Claude noticed that they noticed how much fun he was having. Ooh la la! And when he noticed that, a bad thought crept into his mind. Jean-Claude. Eh? Who are you? I'm a bad thought. 
How did you get into my mind? I've just crept in. Do try to pay more attention, Jean-Claude. What do you want? Well, I know you're thinking that you should let all of the others have a turn on your BTFP Limited. What others? Perfect. Forget I ever came by. Oh, one more thing. Should such a thought ever come into your mind, just remember that if you did let the others use it, they might break it, and they most certainly would wear it out. What are those? And so when the other animals asked if they could have a go on the BTFP Limited, Jean-Claude would say... It's not quite broken in just yet. Or... The handles need some adjusting. Or... I haven't finished testing its parameters. You got the one with parameters? You must have waited 68 weeks for that. Any reason to keep them off his BTFP. Limited? Uh, limited. <laughs> Uh, but just so he wouldn't appear completely selfish, he graciously told them, You are perfectly welcome to continue watching me. Off he bounced, laughing and giggling. <laughs> watching him have fun. Wow. Well, after a few days of this, the other animals finally realized, Hey, he's not sharing the pogo stick. And they came to a decision. Turn about is fair play. Yeah, turn about is fair play. What's that mean? It means that if Jean-Claude won't share the BTFP Limited with us, we won't share our things with him. So everyone determined to keep their most prized possessions away from Jean-Claude. Unfortunately, before too long, everyone started liking the idea of keeping their possessions all to themselves and not letting anyone else use them. Coyote tied up his extra-long jump rope. Nobody uses the rope but me, see? Racket took his huge basket and wove it shut. There's no room in here for anybody else's stuff. Max packed away his nifty pulley. You never know when you might need a little leverage, man. Sully sat motionless at the bottom of his teeter-totter. This is fun. Not sharing. Wow. And on and on it spread. A virtual epidemic of selfishness. Pretty soon nobody was sharing anything with anyone anymore. In fact, the word most often heard around the jungle was... No! Well, actually, the word was mine. Well, that's true. We have used mine a little more often, but... No has such a nice ring to it, don't you guys think? No! See what I mean? Meanwhile, Jean-Claude had been having a grand time on the BTFP. Limited? Limited, limited. He bounced all over the jungle and finally ended up at the bottom of a deep canyon. And high above him was a very steep cliff. That is one big cliff? There was a little rocky ledge jutting out near the top of the cliff. And this gave Jean-Claude an idea. I wonder if my BTFP Limited can reach that ledge. Eh, only one way to find out. He started bouncing in place first, but each one took him higher and higher and higher until finally Jean-Claude shot straight up in the air as high as he could possibly go and came down right on the little rocky ledge. He was very happy with himself. Ooh la la! Until he realized just how high up the ledge was. Jean-Claude was terrified. I've never been this far up without a plane before. In fact, he was too scared to get down. And so, he did the only thing he could do. Assistance! He called out for help. Assistance! At the top of his lungs, this got the attention of all the other animals. Hey, everybody. Did you hear something? Sounded like Jean-Claude calling for his sister. I didn't know he had a sister. Help! He's not calling for his sister. He's calling for help. Should we go help him? No! Love the sound of that. Now, wait a minute. Our friend is in trouble. Just kidding. Come on, guys. Let's go. <laughs> no, 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 no. Love the sound of that word. Help. The animals all followed Jean-Claude's cries into the canyon. There he is! Hey, Jean-Claude, have you got a sister? No one knew what to do. Jean-Claude was too frightened to move. Then, Sully spoke up. Hey, I have an idea. What is it, Sully? We could tie a long rope to a basket and then thread the rope through a pulley and attach the pulley to the rocks just above Jean-Claude's head. Then all Jean-Claude would have to do is get in the basket and we could lower him to the ground. Nah, probably won't work. But all of the animals thought this was a good idea. Until Nozzles reminded them of one very important fact. It's too bad none of us are sharing our possessions anymore. There was an uncomfortable... Animals looked at each other. Uh, say, uh, <clears throat> I think you got a little parsley stuck in your teeth there, uh, Racket. Oh, thank you. I get it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Then Coyote spoke. Well, I'd be willing to contribute me rope to the cause. If Racket is willing to contribute his basket. I'd be willing to do that if, if Max will loan us his pulley. I'd love to loan my pulley if Gruffy will share his tools to attach it. No! Gruffy! Okay. Just kidding, just kidding! Just wanted to hear it one more time. Love the sound of that word. Suddenly, in a wave of unselfishness, everyone started volunteering whatever they could to help get Jean-Claude down from the cliff. I'll provide some nice soft pillows for the basket to set down upon. I'll bring some counterweights to steady the basket's descent. I'll scream real loud if the rope breaks and the basket falls. Millard! Hey, you help in your way, I'll help in mine. Soon, everything they needed to rescue Jean-Claude was in place. The basket was fastened to the rope, the rope was threaded through the pulley, 
and Gruffy and his tools were standing by, ready to attach the pulley to the rocks above Jean-Claude's head. Ah! Just practicing. There was only one thing they hadn't thought of. How to get the basket, the rope, the pulley, the tools, and Gruffy up to the rocky ledge where Jean-Claude was. Only one way Gruffy and all this stuff can get up there. Cheese whiz. All right, two ways. But since we don't have any cheese whiz, he'll have to get up there the same way Jean-Claude did. The BTFP Limited! Of course, in order for Gruffy to use the BTFP Limited, something very important had to happen first. I have to sail? Said Jean-Claude. That's right, Jean-Claude. Either that or you stay up there. moment, Jean-Claude was in a real dilemma. Shell stay. Shell stay. What's the flying squirrel to do? Finally, though, Jean-Claude made up his mind and he dropped the BTFP Limited down to the others. Look out below! <laughs> Gruffy caught it, then tied the basket, rope, and pulley to his tool belt and bounced his way up to Jean-Claude. Yahoo! Whoa! <laughs> wow! In no time, Gruffy had attached the pulley to the rocks above Jean-Claude's head and, with the help of the other animals, slowly let him down. Oh, merci, my friends. Thank you. I thought I was going to be up there for good. I understand now why it is so important to share. I think we all do, Jean-Claude. Yeah, because if you don't, you might get stuck on a cliff somewhere. Well, not only that, it's all part of treating others the way we want to be treated. And now it is my turn to treat all of you. Everyone, back to my tree for some nutty-coated nut bran! I only have 539 open boxes left. So they all went back to Jean-Claude's tree, feeling very good about the lesson they had learned. Uh, guys? Uh, <laughs> hey guys? I, I'm still up here. Hello? Hey you guys, come on! This isn't very funny! Oh well, beautiful view from up here. That was fun, but we're just getting started. Our next story is titled, The Treasure of the Sierra Marbles. Here we go! You know, greed can lead to a lot of trouble. But as Millard the monkey and Sully the aardvark found out, this is a lesson we tend to learn the hard way. It all started on the third Wednesday of last month when Millard ran up to Sully in the little clearing and declared, Sully! Sully! Marbles! Is this supposed to be news, Millard? No, not marbles as in brains. I mean my real marbles. All the pain, all the tragedy. And it was a tragedy, because marbles were very rare in the jungle. That's why Sully and Millard's marble game every third Wednesday was so special. They both had nice marble collections, but Millard's was really nice. Yeah, 23 cat's eyes, six steelies, eight aggies, four puries, and one big glassy with an American flag on one side and the Canadian maple leaf on the other. Millard was very protective of his marbles. In fact, he may have been a little too protective of them, which is what got them lost in the first place. See, I wanted to keep my marbles safe, so I did the only thing I could think of. Grind them into dust? Where were you when I needed you? No, I buried them in a secret spot. Don't tell me. You forgot where you buried them? I thought that might happen, so I took the precaution of making a map to the spot. Oh, you lost the map. Do I look like I have dumbbell written across my face? Well, no, I didn't lose the map. Then where is it? I destroyed it. Millard! I was just trying to be extra safe. I mean, nobody's going to get the best of Miller J. Monkey. Except for Miller J. Monkey. Exactly. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Not counting that time in the Bermuda Triangle, but that's another story. Do you want me to help you look for them? No. I don't even know where to start looking myself. I just have to remember where I buried them. Sorry about the game today, Sully. See you later. Sully watched his friend go. Poor Millard. I wish there was a place where we could get more marbles. Just then, Nozzles the Elephant walked up. Did I hear somebody say marbles? Oh, hi, Nozzles. Yeah, Millard can't find his, and he's really upset about it. I was just wishing that there was some place around here where we could get some more marbles. Well, according to the legend, there's a treasure of marbles here in the jungle. More than you'll ever know what to do with. What legend? Why, the legend of... Um, I didn't quite get that last part, Nozzles. I know. I didn't say it. Don't you know it? Well, yes, I do. I just don't think it's a good idea to tell anybody, that's all. Look, you still have your collection, don't you? Yeah. Well, then maybe you should just share that with Millard. You're better off that way. But why? Because once you start collecting marbles, you won't want to stop. You think you can be content with just a few, but soon you're grabbing every one you can. It won't be that way with me. 
I'll gather just enough to replace the ones Millard lost. Tell me about the legend, please. I'm sorry, Sully. I, I just don't think I should. Nozzle strolled off, leaving behind a very curious and somewhat frustrated Sully. Can you blame me? That night, Sully couldn't sleep. He just kept thinking about the mysterious legend of the marbles. He decided to take a walk and ended up at Millard's house, who, he was surprised to see, was also awake. Millard? Hi, Sully. You couldn't sleep either? No. I just keep thinking about it and thinking about it. Me too. It's gotten so bad every time I close my eyes, the same thought keeps popping into my brain. Where's that treasure? Yeah, I... Treasure? Uh-huh. The treasure of the marbles. Isn't that what you're thinking about? No, I was thinking about how to get a rock out of my bed, but this treasure thing sounds a whole lot more interesting. Sully explained to Millard what Nozzles had told him. A legend? Really? He said it was a legend? Yeah. Wow. What's a legend? And after they'd talked about it, they decided to see if the legend was true. So the next morning, they begged Nozzles to tell them about it. I really shouldn't, fellas. Believe me, you're better off with the collection you have. But you have to tell us, Nozzles. Yeah. Please. Finally, Nozzles gave in. All right, but it's against my better judgment. To get the marbles... Yes? Yes? You have to head for the High Sierras. You mean the High Sierra Mountains? No, I mean the High Sierra family. High and Louis Sierra, the hyena brothers who live on top of the mountain in the center of the jungle. Legend has it they've got a huge collection of marbles and they're giving them away. Now, guys, uh, uh, guys, where'd you go? But Sully and Millard had already taken off. Visions of marbles waltzing in their heads. Actually, my vision's doing more of a tango. The path to the Sierras wasn't easy, and they had a few close scrapes along the way. I scraped my elbow on a rock. I scraped my forehead on a tree. But finally, they made it to the Sierras' front door. They knocked. And after a few seconds, the door opened, and there stood High and Louis Sierra. Look, Louis, an odd rock and a monkey. How charming. Um... We're here for the marbles? Of course you are. But before we let you to them, you'll have to answer a special question. This wasn't part of the legend. I know. We just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> you first, Aardvark. From the periodic table of elements, can you tell me the symbol for sodium? Nah. Correct. You pass. Now you, monkey. From Strunk and White's Book of Proper Usage, give me a sentence using two pronouns. Who, me? Correct. You pass. The Sierras showed Millard and Sully to a long, dark staircase. Through the door at the bottom, you'll find your desire. But beware, and take care, for it could be quite dire. Sully and Millard moved carefully down the stairs. They paused at the bottom. For effect, of course. Then opened the door. And there, in a cavernous room, was the biggest pile of marbles Millard and Sully had ever seen. <gasps> this Beautiful! I'm awestruck by its grandeur. That too! They immediately pulled out a large sack and started filling it with marbles. Wow, look at this, is that A little while later, they stopped for a rest. And that's when the real trouble started. First, Millard casually commented, I've got more marbles than I've ever had before. Forty-five! Unfortunately, Sully had only put forty-four marbles in the bag. So, he reached over and dropped in two more. Now I've got more marbles than I've ever had before, too. Forty-six! This didn't go unnoticed by Millard, who reached over and dropped in yet two more marbles. Yep. Forty-seven for me. Which was immediately countered by Sully, who dropped in two more. Forty-nine! It seems the greed bug had bitten them both very hard, and soon they were stuffing marbles into the bag as fast as they could. Fifty-one! Fifty-seven! Fifty-sixty-two! Fifty-three! Eighty-four! Eighty-five! <laughs> Finally, the bag was so full, not another marble could fit. They decided to leave. Okay, I'll just carry the bag. You'll carry it. I think not. I'll carry it. Oh, you? 
Not with my marbles in it, you won't. Give me that back. Soon they were in a full-fledged argument, which took up more time. At last, they came to an agreement. We'll both carry the bag. And they set out for home. But carrying the bag this way made for very slow going, and they had to stop for the night at the top of the waterfall. They set the bag down between them, but neither one of them got a lot of sleep for fear the other might steal the bag. Sully thought to himself, Miller doesn't really deserve any of these marbles. And Miller had a few thoughts of his own. Boy, this ground is hard. Then Sully thought again. I'm the one who asked Nozzles about the legend. And Miller thought, This ground is really hard. And Sully doesn't deserve any of the marbles either. This went on the whole night until finally, just at dawn, both animals came to the same conclusion. This is the hardest ground I've ever sat on. And then they thought, I should just take the bag of marbles and run. Which they both did. At the same time, they had a huge tug of war with the sack of marbles. And suddenly the sack split wide open, sending the entire collection cascading into the waterfall and into the river below. The marbles! No! Sully and Millard went slowly home and told Nozzles what happened. You were right, Nozzles. Marbles can really do something to an animal. Yeah, dumb old marbles. Hold it. Hold the phone. I think you're both operating under a little misunderstanding. What do you mean, Nozzles? What happened wasn't the marbles' fault. It was your greed that caused the problems. It was? Yep. You see, greed poisons your heart. And it makes you so you don't want to share your things with anybody. And in some cases, greed can even make you take what somebody else has. Wow. Greed always has bad consequences. In this case, greed caused you guys to lose your marbles. And I'm not just talking about the little round ones either. <laughs> Sorry. So Sully and Millard learned an important lesson that day about greed and its consequences. Yeah. We should have remembered that friendship is more important than possessions. We should have been content with what we had. We should have brought along a stronger bag. Well, Sully learned an important lesson. Finally, our last story is called Badminton Schmadmint. Here it comes. You know, each of us are a one-of-a-kind, irreplaceable part of creation. That's beautiful. And every one of us has many different kinds of places we like to go and things we like to do and games we like to play. We're beautiful. Now, even though we don't always want to do the same things at the same time, sometimes, as Gruffy Bear found out, if we all cooperate and work together, we can get a lot more done and have more fun. Everything is beautiful in its own way. One day, Gruffy came out of his cave and said, What a sensational day! This is a fort building day. But it's badminton day. Badminton, schmadminton. What are you kidding me on a day like this? But Gruffy, we all agreed that today would be badminton day. Fort building day isn't until tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. This is a fort building day if I've ever seen one. But we all made plans. Plans, schmans. I really think we should build a fort. Fort smart. While the animals continued their discussion, a line of ants walked up looking for food. But when they saw the animals, a little ant named Bobby suddenly stopped. Hey, did you hear that? I didn't know bears could talk. And look, the skunk is talking too. I saw that last week, but did you see the bear? I never knew bears could talk. Meanwhile, Gruffy's friends finally gave up and left without him. It was then that Gruffy noticed the ants. Well, would you look at that? Ants! And they're all gathered in a little group. Hey, there must be food nearby. Hey, talking bear. Wow, they talk too. Hey, fellas, my name's Gruffy. Hi, Gruffy. I'm Bobby. We were watching you and your friends argue. Oh, you animals sure don't cooperate very well. Cooperate, schmamoperate. It's not a lack of cooperation, really. I, I just don't want to do what everyone else wants to do. We ants cooperate all the time. No, we don't. Yes, we do. You're right, we do. Come on, everybody, back to work. All the ants got back in line and marched off. All that is except Bobby. He stayed behind to talk with Gruffy. You're really not going to do what everyone else wants to do? Nope. Take a lesson from a bear. Cooperation can get pretty old after a while. Sometimes you gotta get out and do your own thing. Give me a hand with this 4 by 8 will you? All right. You know, I should tell the others about this do-your-own-thing thing. A little higher, please. Lift with your legs, not with your back. With your legs. I can't tell you how many mornings I wake up and want to just lie out on a hot sidewalk. Not for too long, of course. A little higher still, please. But no. Every day I get in line and search for food, search for food, search for food. I think I'm going to need you to stand on something. You know what? You're right about this do-your-own-thing thing. I'm going to tell the others. 
thanks, Talking Bear. And with that, Bobby walked off, leaving Gruffy to build his fort. A little higher, please, just a little higher. Bobby caught up with the other ants and told them about Gruffy's do-your-own-thing thing. He actually did that? Even though somebody else wanted him to do something else? He's his own bear, and I want to be my own bear, too. Maybe we should wait until the queen ant gets back this afternoon and ask her about it. No, she'll try to convince us to cooperate, just like the bear's friends. This way, we can each have a hole in the ground to call our own. Yeah! That's right! A hole in the ground to call our own! Let's all be our own bear! But we're ants! Don't confuse the issue! And so the ants, after voting on the issue and carefully mapping out a plan, agreed to do their own thing. Anybody need any help with that? It started out fine. Bobby went off by himself with a little hammock and a jug of lemonade. This is the life. Ah. <sighs> but before long, things started getting sour. First, the hole digging ants started to get hungry. You know what I could go for right now? A good locust carcass sandwich. Oh yeah, where the locust is sliced real thin and piled high. Mmm, I love that. I hear one of the gatherers found a locust carcass this afternoon. Well, what are we waiting for? He's keeping it to himself because of that do-your-own-thing thing. From now on, everyone has to get his own food. Well, I was getting tired of digging this hole anyway. Come on! So the hole diggers stopped digging and wandered off to find food. Here, locust, locust, locust. And when some of the gathering ants came back to rest in the coolness of the hole... Hey, the hole isn't finished. Looks like the hole diggers got tired of digging. But I need shade. I guess we'll have to find it ourselves. So the gatherers also wandered off to look for shade, busy trying to do their own thing that no one was getting any real work done. So when the queen returned home later that afternoon, Instead of a freshly dug hole stocked with food, she found... Nothing! Absolutely nothing! Queen, you're here! Yes! And it would appear that I'm the only one! Where is everybody? Uh, I think they're off doing their own thing thing. Doing their own what what? They're being their own bear. Oh no, not again! Last year everybody was being their own sloth! <sighs> All right, let's get it over with. Take me to the bear. So Bobby took the queen back to Gruffy, who was still trying to build his fort. Just a little higher, I think you'll have it. Don't tell me. You're the talking bear. Oh, good. Another one of you. Why don't you stand on his shoulders, and then if you both stand on your tiptoes... What's the big idea of telling my ants they don't need to cooperate with each other anymore? Well, all I meant was it's good to go off and do your own thing every once in a while. Maybe it is every once in a while, but this isn't every once in a while. Winter is just around the corner, and now we have no hole to stay in and no food to eat. No food? That's terrible. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't know food was involved. A lot of good that does us now. My entire queendom is scattered all over the jungle. Well, I can help you with a place to stay. You can? Sure, with the old power drill here. I'll drill you one of the best homes you ever had. Watch. A single family dwelling. There's a duplex. There's a whole apartment building. <laughs> wow. Hold on, hold on. How do you like the pool? <laughs> well, that's taken care of. But what about the food? I've got it. We'll do the one thing no ant can resist. And later that afternoon, Gruffy had gathered all his friends together in the clearing for the biggest picnic the jungle had ever seen. Man, what a spread. But do you think all the ants will come? Who cares? Have you tried this potato salad? Mm. If we serve it, they will come. Wow, did you guys hear that? It sounded like nozzles. You're right. What did he say? If we serve it, they will come. Rocket and Gruffy looked over and saw Nozzles talking into a large bucket. Hey, Nozzles, why are you talking into that bucket? I don't know. I like the way it sounds. You gotta try this. If we serve it, they will come. You're right. It does sound neat. Hey, Gruffy, give it a go. If we serve it, they will come. Wow! But hopefully they will leave a little behind. One by one, the animals lined up to give the cool-sounding bucket a try. Meanwhile, the ants, in total cooperation, moved in on the picnic. Bobby, take your regiment and capture the potato salad. Greg, you, Cindy, and Marsha, seize the watermelon. Peter, Jan, move your squads into position around the cake. The ants followed the orders to a tee and gathered the food, chanting as they went. We can live twice our way. We can live twice our way. We all love chocolate cake. We all love chocolate cake. Lift with your legs, not with your back. Lift with your legs, not with your back. Legs, yes, back, no. Lift, lift. Keep ho! Sure enough, the ants were cooperating again. And so were the animals, including Gruffy. The rain in Spain. By the way, thank you for all the food. And we did leave you a little potato salad. Hey, say that in here. It sounds great. Thank you all for the food. And we did leave you a little potato salad. Ooh, we all amused. Goodbye. Bye. Hey, guys, I got an idea. Instead of tomorrow being fort building day, let's make it talk in a bucket day. Hey, wait a minute. Everybody, come here. Hey! 
So that year, winter, which is normally no picnic for ants, was very different thanks to cooperation. And all the animals agreed that instead of Fort Building Day, every other Wednesday would be Talk in a Bucket Day. To be or not to be. Hey, I think I feel a soliloquy coming on. Thanks for joining us for Laugh and Learn. Hope you come back again soon for more fun with Joe the Jam and the Rassle Flabbit. Bye-bye. And welcome to Laugh and Learn with Jungle Jam and the Razzle Flabbins. Our first story is called A River Runs Over It. Here we go. You know, each of us are very different from one another. Some big, some tall, some short, some small. Even the animals and the plants and the trees are different from each other. For example, to most of us, trees sound like this. But to other trees, they sound like this. You look great. Have you lost leaves? Well, just a few, thank you. Hey, did you see the pruning maple got? Oh, yes, shocking. Simply shocking. Well, I wouldn't be caught in public like that. Oh, never. A decent tree would cover its branches with leaves. You see, hang out and have animals and kids play on them and be made into forts, and fine furniture, and things like that. A new squirrel family moved on to one of my branches last week. You must be so proud. Hey, did you hear about Larry? Yes, he got a job as a telephone pole down on Main Street. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, what a life. I wonder what he gets paid. Well, it's not the pay, it's the benefits that I like. Oh, yes, all the free long distance he wants. Oh, I can use that. One day, though, a young tree in the jungle wandered off from the pack all by himself and tried to cross a field to get a better view. Location is everything. But on the way, its roots grew real fast, and it got stuck right in the part of the jungle where the animals liked to play. He tried to move. Uh, oh, boy. But it was no use. He was stranded. The next morning, the animals were quite surprised to find it there. Hey! What's this tree doing here? What do you mean? Well, it wasn't here yesterday. How could it not have been there? It's a full-grown tree. No, it's not. It's a young tree. But it's a full-grown young tree. Well, it's not that big. For an ancient redwood, it's a dwarf. Yeah, but for a bonsai, it's a giant. Just then, Gruffy came along taking his morning walk. Dum 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 dum. Hey, guys, what's going on? Hey, Gruffy, look out for that. Oof! tree. What's this doing here? I didn't know it wasn't here yesterday. What do you mean? It's a full-grown tree. We've already been through this. Well, this is a crummy place for a tree. Poor thing has no view or anything. He must be miserable here in the middle of this field. And to the amazement of it, pulled the tree right out of the ground. Ah, there you go. Ah. And planted it neatly where it wouldn't be in the way so much. There you are. You won't be in anyone's way here. And it's a much nicer view. Look at that. <laughs> All right, fella. And with that, Gruffy continued on his morning walk. Dum 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 dum. Did you see that? He moved the tree like it was nothing. Hey, Gruffy. Huh? Wait, how come you never told us you were so strong? That was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. What was? Picking up that tree and moving it over there. You're incredibly strong. Well, I guess that is a pretty big tree. Although if it were a redwood, it'd be pretty small. Then again, for a bonsai, it's a giant. It certainly is. You're really amazing. Hmm. Well, I, I guess I am strong. <laughs> well, you know, I eat right and get plenty of exercise, take all my vitamins. Here, let me make a muscle. Ooh, wow. What the heck? Whoa. <laughs> hey, not bad. Wow. It must be great to be so mighty. Well, yeah, now that you mention it, it is. You're really special. Well, yeah, but uh, I bet we all have things that make us special. Yeah, like Max can reach apples on the tops of apple trees without even standing on his tiptoes. Ooh, wow. Apples, anyone? That is special. <laughs> mm. And owls are special, too, because they can see really far. I see there are berries on a bush exactly three miles due east. You can see that far? Without even squinting. And it looks like they're ripe, too. Ah, there you go. Now that's special. Bye, everybody. Hey, hey. Dum, 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 dum. And sudden boast. I can remember everything I see and hear. I read the dictionary once, and I remember the meaning of every word. Ooh. How about the uh, dromedary? A one-humped, domesticated camel of northern Africa and western Asia. Oh. Ah. And the boasting continued for quite some time. I can make my tongue into a four-leaf clover. You mean the shape of a four-leaf clover? No, a four-leaf clover. Look. Oh. Oh. Yeah. It seemed everyone had some special thing they could show off to the others. I could stand on my hands. I could do a cartwheel. Look, I've created atomic fusion. Ooh. Ah. Everyone joined in. Well, 
everyone, that is, except Sully. He ooed and odd for a while, but then he started to become sad because he couldn't think of anything special he could do. I'm just an aardvark. Hey, Sully, what can you do? Sully thought real hard. Uh, I built a house out of popsicle sticks once. Done that. Did it. Did it twice. I made a hotel. I made a chain of hotels. We'll leave the light on. <laughs> I made a small city. Ever see those rings on Saturn? Popsicle sticks. Wow! Hey, Sully! Ever done anything like that? Um... Can't you do something special, Sully? Like jump real high or hold your breath real long? Well, one time I was on the Discovery Channel. Done that, did it! Been on twice. I got a series. Ever hear a CNN? Popsicle sticks. Anything else, Sully? Uh, give me some time to think about it. So, Sully thought and thought. Popsicle sticks. Wow. After a while, he wandered away from the group feeling sad, as though he weren't special at all. I could always try catching snails, although I'm not a very quick animal. Which reminded Sully of his friend the sloth. Talk about your animals that aren't very quick, thought Sully. Where's the sloth today? It was already afternoon, and the sloth was usually out playing with everybody by now. So Sully decided to go over to the sloth's house and see what was going on. Along the way, Sully saw a raging river. He was trying to find a good place to cross it when all of a sudden he noticed something on a rock right in the middle of the river. Help! It was the sloth. Sloth, what are you doing on that rock? That's dangerous. Sully, I'm stuck. I started across this morning when there was just a trickle, but look at it now. Don't move. I'll go get help. Sully didn't have much time because the rushing water was only a few inches from the top of the rock the sloth was standing on. He ran as fast as he could to get the others. Come on, you guys! The sloth's in trouble! Soon, the whole gang was back at the river. But nobody knew what to do. Well, I can't really pick up the river and move it. Of course, you never know till you try. Yeah, Gruffy, give it a try! All right, all right. Let me see here. Let me get this. Well, now, now, I just, I just can't seem to get a grip on it. Well, I am pretty strong, but I, I guess that's not going to help much here. Well, I don't think standing on my hands will do us much good. Yeah. And a popsicle stick bridge would take way too long to build. Not that I couldn't do it, though. There's got to be something we can do. Hey, I have an idea. Not now, Sully. We're trying to save the sloth. Look upstream. What? What, what? what is it? The river gets really narrow up there. We could all get in the water and, and stand really close together and block the flow of the river. You mean form an animal dam? No, I mean we could all get in the water and, and stand really close together and block the flow of the river. That's an even better idea. And so the whole gang ran up to the narrow part of the river to form the dam. That is, they all got in the water and stood really close together and blocked the flow of the river. That's the best idea yet. Why didn't I think of that? Nozzles the elephant got in first. <sighs> There we go. After that... Ooh, this water's a little colder than it looks. There were only a few remaining holes to fill. All the animals helped out. I got this one covered. I got this one! Get that one over there! Soon the water stopped rushing, and the level of the water around the rock went down. Sully ran out to the rock and carried the sloth back to safety. All right, everyone. You can come out of the water now. Everyone in the dam climbed onto Nozzle's back as he stood up and stepped out of the water. Thanks for helping me, Sully. Ah, uh, it was nothing. <laughs> I gotta hand it to you, Sully. You are one very special animal. But all I did was look life from a raging river. <laughs> While we were all just talking about how special we are, you were out doing something special. Sully, I think you showed everyone that thinking of others is much more important than... Well, am I doing a cartwheel? Forcing freshly baked pies two miles due west. Although that is special. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Dum de dum dum dum. Yes, everybody is special. Look, everyone. Wow, that rock the sloth was on is completely covered by water. You can't even see it anymore. And that day, everyone also learned that boasting isn't such a good idea. Oh, I can still see it. Well, almost everyone. <laughs> But we're just getting started. Our next story is called The Grandfather. Here it comes! You know, there's a wise old saying that says a gossip ruins friendships, which is exactly what the Jungle Jam gang learned in today's story. Not that I mean to be talking behind their backs. Then again, you are the narrator. Well, that's true. You see, it all started one day when a very old raccoon, along with two younger raccoons, came passing through the little clearing in the jungle. Sully, the aardvark, happened to be taking a walk and met the raccoons at the entrance of the clearing. Hi. Hello. My name is Don, 
And this is Vinny, and this is Babalu. Ah, uh, Lou for short. That is short. They're two of my grandsons. Your grandsons? Yes. I'm the grandfather. That's beautiful, Louie and Bob. That's Vinny and Lou. Sorry. The grandfather explained to Sully that he and his grandsons were on their way to visit his granddaughter. Angela, my oldest son's youngest daughter. We've heard she's going to have a baby. Wow. It's quite a large family we have. No wonder they call you the grandfather. That's beautiful, Louis and Bobbis. That's Vinny and Lou. Sorry. The grandfather went on to explain that they still had quite a ways to go and were wondering if there was a place in the clearing that they could spend the night. You can stay at my place. Are you sure? Absolutely. Then it's an offer I cannot refuse. You really are a great grandfather. Not yet, but we're hoping any day now. For today, I'm still just the grandfather. That's beautiful, Luby and Bobble. That's Vinny and Lou. Sorry. I just think they're really good. One day we hope they will be on Star Search. It is my dream. As Sully and his guests headed for Sully's house, Jean-Claude, the flying squirrel, happened to be flying by and spotted Sully with the strangers. I wonder what Sully's up to now. Jean-Claude flew on ahead and quickly landed his plane near Racket the Skunk's house. Uh... Racket! Hi, Jean-Claude. Have you seen the strangers with Sully? Well, no, I haven't even seen Sully. I was just reading this book called Modern Times. It's very interesting. I'm sure it is, but... It's all about how things haven't changed since thousands of years ago. For instance... A thousand years ago, bears slept in caves, just like they do now. Imagine. (laughs) Never mind that. Here they come. Who? The strangers. They're walking with Sully. Look. What do you mean, those raccoons? They look like they're Sully's friends. We don't know that. And if they are, how come Sully has never told us about them before? I suppose it never came up. The older one does look a bit like a picture in my book. He's in your book? This is worse than I thought. Why? I'm sure Sully will introduce us to his friends sooner or later. I cannot sit and wait. I must tell the others. And with that, Jean-Claude sped off. I don't see why it's so important we tell everybody about a raccoon that looks kind of like some other old raccoon in my book. As Jean-Claude sped through the jungle, he ran into Gruffy Bear. Dum 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 Gruffy, Racket has a book on modern crimes and it has a picture of an old raccoon that's staying at Sally's house. Can you believe it? Believe it? I can't even understand it. Racket has a book on modern crimes. It has a picture of an old raccoon and it's the same raccoon I saw going into Sally's house. Are you sure? I saw it with these very own eyes. I must tell the others. And with that, Jean-Claude sped off once again. (laughs) Gruffy was amazed at the news he just heard. Wow, Racket has a book? Wait a minute. I wonder how long Sully's known this guy. Maybe Sully doesn't even know about the crime thing. He could be in danger. Just then, Millard the monkey came walking by. Millard, did you hear about Sully and the criminal raccoon? No, but did you hear the one about the guy who threw his alarm clock out the window? Not now, Millard. Racket has a book on crimes. This old raccoon character has committed every single one in it. That makes him the head crime guy. Wow. Sully gets to have all the fun. Well, I better get going, Millard. We gotta warn the others. Oh, bye, Gruffy. Wait a minute. Racket has a book? No sooner had Gruffy left than Nozzles the Elephant came walking by. Nozzles, did you hear about Sully? I don't know. What do you mean? He threw his alarm clock out the window. Wait a minute. That's not it. Oh, yeah. He has a famous raccoon staying with him. Really? He wrote the book on crime. Either that or he's writing a book on crime. Or one or the other. Anyway, Racket has a picture of him. What? Are you sure? Either that or he has a picture of Racket. Uh, Gruffy says he's the head crime guy of all the crime guys. Oh, my. Well, this could be serious. Or not. (laughs) It's getting hard to tell. Just then, Jean-Claude came flying up. Uh... Nazils, did you hear about... I heard, I heard. I'm not sure what, but I heard. We've got to tell the others. I'll fly around and get them all to meet us back here. Good idea. I hope. Jean-Claude raced off to get the others. And before long, all of the jungle animals were gathered at the meeting place. Just then, Racket walked by. Hey, guys, what's up? Racket, have you heard about... Um, will somebody please tell him what's going on? Sully's being held hostage by some big crime boss. Sully? Racket was shocked as everyone explained what they heard about Sully and the old raccoon. 
He became so concerned that he didn't even let them finish. Well, let's not just stand around talking about it. Let's go save Sully. Yeah! Come on! So off they went, torches in hand, ready to storm Sully's house. <laughs> I love this. They approached Sully's house quietly. Hey, Sully, did you hear about the guy who threw his alarm clock out the window? Miller! He wanted to see time fly. <laughs> Gruffy? Uh, right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, Jean-Claude? Emmett is. I guess it's time to turn over the tape. See you on the other side. All right, you head crime boss guy. Get out here right now. Or whenever you're ready. No sense getting him angry. <laughs> we'll wait. No, we won't. Let's go. The mob ran in screaming. Ah! Sully was the first to wake up to the sound of his screaming friends. Ah! Hi, guys. What's up? Shh. We're here to save you. Oh, thank you. Um, do you think you could save Bleeble and Blabble and their grandfather? That's Vinny and Lou. Sorry. There they are. Grab them. Before Sully could say another word... I got him! The animals quickly tied up and gagged the old raccoon. They didn't know who the other two raccoons were, but they tied and gagged them also, just in case they were somebody who might need to be tied and gagged. Wait a minute. You guys don't understand. It's okay. I said he could have the top bunk. Sully, I don't think you realize who this is. What are you talking about? This is the head crime guy. He threw a picture of an alarm clock out the window. Millard! That's right, isn't it? He's meaner than all the crime guys put together. The grandfather? <laughs> That's beautiful. You should hear it without the gags. They're going to be on Star Search someday. Wow. It's too bad the grandfather's a crime guy. The crime guy. <laughs> hey, he's trying to say something. Sully ungagged the old raccoon. Uh, <coughs> I'm not a crime guy. I knew he wasn't a crime guy. But he is, I tell you. He is? Wow, I hope... Who told you I was a crime guy? Yeah, who told me that? I heard from Millard something about you inventing crimes that were worse than anything in the book, I think. Hold it, I didn't say that. I said Graffy told me that he wrote a book on crime, remember? I hate it when you guys misquote me. Wait a minute, I didn't say that. I said Jean-Claude told me that Racket had a crime book listing all the crimes he committed. It is all true. Racket has a picture of him in a book on modern crimes. Modern crimes? I don't have a book on modern crimes. Oh, yes? Then what is this right here? Modern times? Modern times? Modern times! I think we may owe someone an apology. Sorry, Gruffy. Not me, him. We're sorry, Mr. Raccoon. No offense. None taken. The grandfather introduced himself and his two grandsons, Vinny and Lou. Well, we really got mixed up here. I'm sorry I started this whole thing. I'm sorry I continued it. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. Me, too. That day, the animals saw how much damage gossip can cause. And they almost missed out on making some wonderful new friends. The two grandsons and... The grandfather. That's beautiful, Franklin and Zombies. That's Vinny and Lou. Sorry! Finally, our last story is called A Portrait of the Rabbit as a Young Family. Here it comes! You know, it's important to be sensitive to the feelings of others, and that's exactly the lesson the Jungle Jam gang learned in today's story. It all started when Racket the Skunk was coloring one day and a rabbit walked up. You know, you do great work, Racket. Well, thank you. Would you come over to my house and draw a picture of me? You mean a portrait? Either way, I'm easy. Racket was really excited about his new opportunity. Business has really picked up since I got my new set of crayons. It's the big pack. 128 with twin sharpeners in the back. They're for the serious colorer. And Racket certainly was a serious, uh, colorer. <laughs> Which was a good thing, because by the time he got to the rabbit's house, there was a whole group of rabbits waiting to have their picture drawn. That's portrait. Either way, we're easy. Wow. There's a whole lot more of you than I expected. Uh, yeah, uh, I thought it would be nice to have my whole family in the picture with me. I hope you don't mind. Once Racket got everybody into position and the light was just right, he tried to think of the perfect color with which to draw the white bunnies. There are many different shades of white, actually. It's, it's not something you can rush into. Just then, Racket noticed the rabbit family had grown by about eight. Well, perhaps I'd better get started, then. Will there be any more of you? Well, you never know when relatives will drop by. But just as Racket picked out the perfect crayon, he looked up and noticed that he was beginning to lose the sunlight. Well, that's all for today. 
Racket apologized to the rabbits for the delay and explained that these things take time. I am an artist, you know. The rabbit family agreed to have Racket come back the next day to finish the portrait. Well, I don't know if I'll finish, actually. So Racket put his 128 crayons back into their box and then tucked the box into his backpack and started home. I think I'll call my picture Portrait of the Rabbits as a Young Family. Yeah, I like that. Unfortunately, as he walked, two things happened that Racket didn't notice. One was that the lid of the crayon box worked itself open inside his backpack, and the other was that the bottom of the backpack had a little hole in it, and as he walked, each of his crayons fell out of the little hole and onto the ground. It wasn't until Racket got into his house and started to unpack that he noticed that all 128 of his crayons were gone. Not a single one is left. Not a tangerine orange, not a fire engine red, not even the purple one that they insist on calling violet. Racket was very sad. He had lost his favorite crayons. Then he realized that the rabbit family was probably growing in numbers every minute. Oh, no. There's no telling how many relatives might show up. If I don't find those crayons and get back there soon, I'm going to need a wide-angle crayon just to fit everybody in the picture. Racket decided to put up signs around the jungle that said lost crayons. But, of course, he didn't have any crayons to write the signs with, so he just hung the blank sheets of paper on the trees. The next morning, Sully came by and saw the blank sheets of paper. Look! Somebody lost their crayons! Meanwhile, the other animals saw Racket and asked why he was so sad. It's awful! I can't believe it! Whatever it is, it can't be that bad. We've got a lot to be grateful for. Someone out there's lost their crayons. Uh, do you know, Sally? I saw the signs on the trees this morning. Now that's something to be sad about. See, Racket, there's always someone worse off than you. Well, actually, those are my signs. Yours? Yep. What do I feel about one inch tall? Not only that, I'm trying to finish a portrait of the rabbit family. Oh, I know how that can be. Yeah, relatives. Sorry, Racket. That's a bummer. Hey, I have an idea. What's that? Let's go swimming. Oh, swimming. That sounds great. I do love a good swim every now and again. Come on, Racket. I can't believe it. I thought you guys were my friends. I thought you'd at least help me look for my crayons. Oh, we will, Racket. Of course we will. You don't want to be off looking for your crayons by yourself. You could get lost out there. No, no, you're going to need some help. After all, 18 eyes are better than two. We'll do it first thing. All right, well, that's more like it then. Right after kickball and nap time. What? We promise. Right after. I thought you said you were going swimming. Well, that's first. And then kickball and nap time, and then we look for my crayons? Oh, no, no, no. After swimming is uh, wallet making and canoeing. Then comes kickball and nap time. Did you not get a schedule this morning? Racket didn't understand why his friends weren't being more concerned about the seriousness of his problem. But he waited patiently anyway. Soon, it began to get dark. Um, guys, do you think maybe we could go look for my crayons now? I've just gotten word that eight more kids and two grandkids showed up at the rabbit family. Oh, yeah, the crayons. Bummer. Well, it's getting too late now. The sun will be going down any minute. Maybe we can go first thing tomorrow morning, right after breakfast and fort building. That sounds like a good plan. Yep, right after fort building. We'll skip our break and go right into crayon finding. We won't wait a minute longer. You mean no break after fort building? Well, yeah, maybe you're right. We don't want to be too tired when we're trying to find crayons. First thing, right after the break. Perfect. We promise. They're as good as found. I feel better already, don't you? <laughs> yeah, great. Well, I'll see you all later. Racket turned and, with his head hanging down, walked back to his home. What's the matter with him? Racket couldn't wait another minute. He decided to go out and look, no matter how dark it was. Wow, it sure is dark. But off he went anyway. Not too much later, the other animals noticed that Racket didn't show up for bedtime stories around the campfire. They became concerned that he was missing. This is serious. He shouldn't have gone out at night by himself. Well, maybe we better go look for him. I think you're right. There's no telling what could happen to him. We better go first thing in the morning, right after arts and crafts. Uh, guys, you know, Racket could get lost out there. I think, I think we better go look for him right now. But what about bedtime stories? All right, after bedtime stories, but I mean right after. And they better be short stories. Two short stories? Two short stories, but that's it. What, no song? Two short stories, a song, a poem, and three bags of roasted marshmallows later, off they went. At first they were all a little nervous, but decided that if they stuck together, they'd be okay. They searched high and low, but they couldn't find Racket anywhere. This made Nozzles very worried. You know, guys, we've got a real problem here. What's that, Nozzles? Well, I think Racket is lost. Oh, no! 
Uh, I think we've got an even bigger problem. What's that, Gruffy? I think we're lost. Uh, no, no, that's no reason to panic. You got a better one? Well, at least we're not hearing spooky sounds and things. <laughs> you had to say it, didn't you? You just couldn't leave well enough alone. No, look, it, it could be worse. Well, Nozzles is right. I mean, after all, we're only lost in the jungle with no food and... Night coming on and lots of scary noises surrounding us. Uh, uh, could, could, could you go over this one more time with me, Nozzles? Just how could this be worse? Well, at least we're all together. We could be out here alone. Like Racket. Suddenly, all the animals realized that they should have been more sensitive to their friend. But there was nothing more they could do until morning. It was just too dark. So... They decided to make camp for the night next to a large fallen log. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. The next morning, they were all awakened by the sound of snoring. Well, naturally, they all looked at Gruffy. Don't look at me. I haven't slept a wink. This log's been snoring all night. Wait a minute. Logs don't snore. Hmm. You may be right. Sounds like it's coming from behind that log. You mean over there where Rack? Looks like it didn't keep him up all night. Some people can sleep through anything. Rackets! Sure enough, huh? there behind the log what? was Racket. <sighs> hey, guys. What are you doing out here? You could have gotten lost. We came to find you. But I thought you had such a busy schedule. We did, but we realized it was more important to help our friend. Yeah. Sorry we didn't help you find your crayons. That's okay. I didn't find him either. Well, I guess I'd better go tell the rabbits I can't do their portrait. We'd go with you except for one thing. We're lost. You too? What are we going to do? We could start a signal fire. Or send up a flare. Or we could follow this trail of crayons. Nah, they'd probably just lead us back to Racket's house. Crayons? They all looked down, and there on the path were all of Racket's crayons lying end to end. Look, it's my tangerine orange and my fire engine red. And even the purple one that they insist on calling Violet. One by one, the animals found them all. Here is our kid. I've got the mulberry here. I found cornflower. Bittersweet here. Here's mace. Oh, you can leave that one. Soon, all of Racket's crayons were safely in their box. Except for mace. I never much liked that color. And Racket hurried off to finish the portrait of the rabbits as a young family. Well, I don't know if I've finished, actually. Of course, by that time, more than 250 rabbit grandkids alone had shown up. So Gruffy, Nozzles, and the others pitched in to help with the picture. Uh, that's, uh, that's portrait, I believe. Mm. Either way, we're easy. easy. Thanks for joining us for Laugh in there. Hope you come back again soon for more fun with Jim the Jam and the Razzle Flemings. Bye-bye. is called the Goodbye Merle. Here we go! Say, did I ever tell you about Marvy Snuffleson? Hello. Marvy loved adventures. He loved hearing stories full of adventure and playing fun adventure games. Marvy! Just a second, Dad. Marvy, come inside. I'm flying a jumbo jet. Now, your grandmother came a long way to see you, Marvy, so land and get in here. Okay. She has a surprise for you, too. Besides, it's almost dinner time and it looks like it's going to rain out there. So Marvy came inside, Hi, Grandma. gave his grandmother a kiss, and tore into the present. But he was quite surprised when he got past the wrapping and saw what it was. Socks? Marvy's father reminded him he should say thank you. But it's socks. I landed a jumbo jet for socks? Marvy. Socks aren't very fun. Marvy, say thank you. I thought it was a video adventure game or something. Marvy. Marvy looked up. He could tell his father was not happy with him at all. Uh-oh. I think you need to learn to be a little more grateful when someone gives you a present, Marvy. Marvy knew precisely where he was headed next. My room? Precisely. But I'm hungry. Marvy. Marvy's head drooped low and he walked up the stairs. He shut the door behind him, walked over to his bed, and buried his head in his pillow. Pretty soon he heard the rain start falling outside and thought maybe he should close his window. Before he could get up, it began to rain really hard. Marvy looked up from his pillow just in time to see a big wave wash in his open window. He picked up his bed and spun it around the room. Whoa! He held on with all his might as the giant wave carried him and his bed right out the window and off onto the high sea. Whoa! When Marvy woke up, he found himself on a beautiful island beach. Have I done this before? Just then, 
He saw something round and furry walking toward him on the beach. I have done this before. Don't tell me. You're a frasmatazzle. Uh, that's Razzleflabbin. Oh, what's your name? Merle. I'm Marvy. Do you know Sven? Sven? Sven Ingersoll. He's a razzmatazzle. No, it's a big island, Marvy. Merle the razzmatazzle. That's Razzleflabbin. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Razzleflabbin. Anyway, even though he looked and sounded very much like Sven, he lived on lowly terms in a little grass hut through which the breeze blew freely. Come on in. Food was sparse. There were no conveniences and few sources of entertainment. Basic cable, but none of the movie channels. But Merle the Razzleflabbin was grateful for every piece of fruit he could find or fish he could catch. Marvy, would you like to play a game with me? Marvy got very excited. I love games. But when Merle pulled out a bunch of sticks, rocks, and coconut shells, Marvy couldn't believe it. What other games do you have? This is the only one. Marvy was amazed that Merle didn't die of boredom with no high-tech games that were manufactured or purchased. There's nothing here that even needs batteries. Merle showed Marvy his coconut shell and stick game and some fruit in a neat pillow he'd made out of palm leaves. You sleep on this? Well, on the pillow. It's not even soft. Marvy, I'm a razzle flappin. I'm covered in fur from head to toe. What do I need soft? When Marvy expressed his lack of interest and the fact that he was quite unimpressed with the game, the fruit. The pillow and the socks his grandmother gave him. One at a time, each of them disappeared. Hey, cool! Marvy was astounded. How did you do that? I didn't, Marvy. You did. I did? Yes. On this part of Razzle Flamin Island, when you're ungrateful for things, those things disappear. Marvy apologized, but still thought it was pretty cool. Well, I don't have a lot of stuff, so do try to be more careful. Oh, okay. Sorry. And that looked like a nice pair of socks too. Hey, do you have anything to eat around here? Well, sure. Merle pulled out his food finding map. Food finding map? Pretty handy, huh? You don't just have a cupboard or refrigerator or something? Maybe a tacos, tacos, tacos? Marvy, look around. It's an island where Italian food is predominantly preferred. So off they went with the map, searching for something to eat. But the hike was no quick, easy trip. In fact, they walked for hours without finding anything. When they finally decided to stop and rest. Marvy wondered. Are we there yet? Well, according to the map, the fruit trees should be close by. Fruit trees? I was thinking along the lines of a jolly meal. You know, with a little toy dinosaur and maybe a hamburger and fries or something. We'll just have to keep looking once we catch our breath. Merle explained that for now they should enjoy the clean air, cool breeze, and this nice flat rock we can rest on. Merle began to study the map, but Marvy, hungry and tired, was not at all satisfied with this and began to complain about the map being worthless. What good is this map? It's not leading us anywhere near food. Can't we just order something? And then he complained that the flat rock wasn't very flat at all and that it was very uncomfortable. Merle looked up. You're not being ungrateful, are you, Marvy? Well, I just don't see a lot to be grateful for here. Marvy, that's not a very good idea. You know, Merle, you're not nearly as much fun as Sven was. Marvy, please don't say things like that. At least you can turn into stuff. Can't you turn into stuff? Like maybe a pizza delivery guy. Oh, Marvy, Marvy, please take that back! But it was too late. The map, the flat rock, and Merle all began to disappear. Marvy, Marvy! Marvy looked around. He was all alone. It was mapless, flat rockless, and Merleless. Oh well, who needs a silly old rock or a map anyway? However, it would have been handy to have Merle around to help him get back to the beach. Oh yeah. Marvy decided he'd better get walking. He tried heading in a few different directions, but found nothing worth eating or sitting on. Sven could have turned into a sofa, maybe even a whole corner group with a hide a bed. Marvy kept walking. He was getting hungrier and hungrier by the minute. Suddenly, he stepped into a clearing. There before him was a three guys from Italy restaurant. A fine little bistro, a bit overpriced, but the eggplant parmigiana is second to none. At last, something to eat. The maitre d' stepped up. May I help you? Do you have eggplant parmigiana? It's second to none, but you'll not be dining here, young man. Why not? The maitre d' pointed to a sign in the window. No shoes, no shirt, no socks, no service. Marvy looked down. He had a shirt and he had shoes, but sure enough, he had no socks. Ergo, no service. But I'm starving. Too bad. Didn't your grandmother ever give you a pair of socks? Why, yes, she did. But they disappeared. Oh, if only I had been grateful for my socks, I'd be eating eggplant parmesan right now. A bit overpriced, but second to none. The maitre d' shook his head. The riffraff we get on this island. Turned and walked away. Marvy was so hungry he just couldn't take it anymore. He sat down and began to cry. Oh, if only I'd been grateful. He didn't realize how awful not having all the things he had complained about would be. Just then, the maitre d' tossed Marvy a small dinner roll. Here, you can have this. It was left over. 
Thank you. I'm starved. Marvy took a big bite of the roll. Wow, it's not very big, but it sure tastes great. I sure am grateful for this small leftover dinner roll. As soon as Marvy expressed his gratefulness for the small roll, it suddenly grew into a full-size loaf of French bread. Sourdough. Not too hard with a delightful cheese sauce. Whoa, this is enough for me and Merle. Oh no, Merle! Marvy remembered how his ungratefulness had made Merle disappear. I miss Merle. Sure, he's not thin, but I miss him just the same. No sooner did Marvy say this out loud than Merle began to reappear. Merle, is that you? The more Marvy showed his excitement and gratefulness, the more clear Merle became. Marvy! Marvy! Merle immediately noticed the delicious French bread in Marvy's hand. Marvy, that looks great! But don't you go filling up on bread now. Huh? You gotta try it with the eggplant parmigiana. It's fantastic! Marvy looked back over at the sign in the window of the restaurant. Boy, I'd sure be grateful right now for those socks my grandmother gave me. Just then, Marvy looked down at his feet. Instantly, his socks reappeared. Hey! Nice socks! How many in your party? Said the maitre d'. Two! This way, please. Charlie, set up a table for two. Quickly, quickly! Have you seen his socks? Marvy and Merle had a wonderful dinner. Second to none. In fact, dinner never tasted so good to Marvy. And he was never so grateful for his food. Or his socks. After they finished eating, Marvy and Merle walked back to the beach. It's too bad this whole island is so big. It took us so long to get back to the beach. The sun's already going down. <gasps> Merle gasped at the sound of Marvy's statement. Marvy! Ah, oh, but I'm really glad the island is here, and I'm so thankful that I got to meet you. Phew! That was a close one. Sorry. Marvy climbed up into his nice warm bed. I'm thankful I got to meet you too, Marvy. The two friends said goodbye. 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 And Marvy watched as Merle walked off toward his humble hut. And then Marvy put his head down onto his pillow, shut his eyes, and drifted off to sleep. Morning. He was back home. And the very first thing he did was go downstairs and apologize to his grandmother. Then he promised his father he would never be ungrateful again, especially for socks. <laughs> But we're just getting started. Our next story is titled, Dial M for Monkey. Here we go. You know, sometimes things that make us afraid aren't really that scary at all. But that's not always easy to remember, especially if you're a little monkey like Millard and you start hearing scary voices. What? Why me? Well, didn't you want today's story to be about you? Well, yeah, but I was thinking it would be more along the lines of all the other animals finally come to see that Millard is the smartest and trace chores for him and feed him bites of banana cream pie while fanning him with palm leaves. Do you have any stories like that? Mm, not today. Oh, great. So instead, we're going to scare the daylights out of the little monkey. Ha, ha, ha. Won't that be fun? Well, Miller, it all works out okay. It couldn't be Gruffy starts hearing scary voices, or Nozzle starts hearing scary voices, or how about the narrator starts hearing scary voices? Now there's a story. Okay, Miller. I just thought you wanted a story you could star in. Or how about... Star? But I'm sure we have another story here somewhere. Did you say star? Uh, let's see. I've got one with Gruffy, one with Nozzles. <laughs> oh, Mr. Narrator, <laughs> I was only fooling. Let's not get hasty here. Uh, you just go right ahead with the story we had planned. <laughs> no one mentioned star. Well, okay. You see, it all started when Millard... Our star. <laughs> ...decided he wanted to have a phone put into his treehouse. I live in a very modern part of the jungle. Here you go, Mr. Monkey. All the wires are in. It'll probably be hooked up and working first thing in the morning. If you need anything else, don't hesitate to call me at the phone company. Okay, bye. Oh, boy, a new phone. Who should I call first? Uh, I should get it figured out while I'm waiting for the line to start working. And that's exactly what he did. He made lists and pie charts, graphs and equations, drew sine waves, and calculated pi to the 300th digit. He stayed up most of the night trying to decide who to call first. Finally, he figured it out. Sully! After all, he is my best friend. And he's the only one I know besides me who has a phone. When Millard finally got to bed, he was so tired he slept all the way until noon the next day. You try calculating pi to the 300th digit. But when he got up, he ran right over to his new phone. Sully's gonna love this! Unfortunately, Sully was already on the phone. Rats. What a letdown. But then a very strange thing happened. Before Millard even had a chance to give his new number out to his friends, the phone rang. Hmm. Now who could that be? Hello? Hello. It was a deep, scary voice. I'm going to come to your house soon. And when I do, you'd better be there. <laughs> What? I'll be looking for you. L looking for me? Yes. I'm going to take care of you once and for all. Millard was terrified. Ah! 
He ran as fast as his little feet could take him all the way to Sully's house. Sully! 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 Quiet down, Millard. I'm on the phone. But Sully! Yes, that's pepperoni, black olives, green peppers. Sully! Now I have to go. I'll call you back. Sully, a scary man called my house. He said he was going to take care of me once and for all. You got a phone and you didn't call me first thing? Well... After a while, Sully and Millard thought they had it all figured out. The guy who called must have the wrong number. Yeah, yeah. So, after a while... You want to see my new phone? Yeah. They went back to Millard's house. But not long after they got there, the phone rang. You want to get it? I don't want to get it. I don't want to get it either. It's your phone. Oh. Hello? I'm going to come to your house tomorrow to take care of you once and for all. Millard was shaking like a leaf. It's him. Ask him who he thinks he's talking to. Here, you ask him. No, you ask him. Oh. <clears throat> do you even know who you're talking to? Yes. You do? Yes. Millard and Sully's knees were shaking. Millard J. Monkey. Ah! Millard quickly hung up the phone, and he and Sully ran as fast as they could and hid under the kitchen table. He knew who I was, Sully. He knew who I was. I heard, Millard. What are we going to do? We? It's your phone. Hey! Well, I don't know, but I don't think we should get out from under this kitchen table anytime soon. Right. So, Millard and Sully stayed under the table. They stayed there right on through lunchtime, and then on through dinner time, And they even stayed there when it was time to go to bed. I'm getting kind of cold. Yeah, it sure would be great if we had some blankets under here and maybe a sandwich. We could get that. I tell you what, I'll stay under here, and you run as fast as you can to my bedroom, grab all the blankets, then fix us some sandwiches and run right back. Me? Well, yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking you would go. It is your phone. Oh, no, 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 no. That could never work. That would mean I would have to let go of this table leg, and I just don't see that happening anytime soon. This is my table leg. So they waited there under the table, shivering. (laughs) (laughs) All right, all right. I'll go get the blankets. Millard ran as fast as he could. Ah! and returned with the blankets. Thanks, Millard. No problem. Uh Uh-oh. I guess it's time to turn over the tape. See you on the other side. Even with the blankets, however, the two still couldn't get to sleep. That is, until Sully said, I'll bet somebody's just making a prank. A prank? A joke. They think it's funny to scare us. Next time this guy calls, see if he even knows where you live. A prank? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably what it is. (laughs) Yep, a prank. Huh. Well, I guess we can go to sleep then. (laughs) You mean, get out from under the table? Well... It is nice and warm, now that we have the blankets. It'd be a shame to leave, since we made everything so comfortable and all. I think we should stay under here. I think so, too. And that's just what they did. Good night, Sully. Good night, Millard. The next morning, Millard and Sully climbed out from under the table and started to make breakfast. I feel much better today. Me, too. They dove back under the table. Millard looked at Sully. Sully quickly spoke up. Your phone. Oh. Slowly, Millard stood, walked over and picked it up. Hello? I'm coming to your house today, and you'd better be there. (laughs) Ask him if he even knows where you live. Hey, do you even know where I live? Of course. I've been to your house before. (laughs) Beyond the old oak tree, just past the swimming hole, make a left at the second banana tree. You live in the third tree house, to the right. Actually, it's the fourth. Oh, that's right. I couldn't read my writing. Nice going, Millard. Oops. So, be at your house, Mr. Monkey. I'm going to take care of you once and for all. Ah! Millard quickly hung up the phone. He's coming over here today. Ah! My nerves are just shot. I know, I know. My phone. Oh... Hello? It's me again, Carlisle. I'm right down the street, and I'm headed to your house. And you'd better be there 
I'm going to. I know, I know. Take care of me once and for all. Millard hung up the phone, about to cry. <laughs> Here's an idea. Let's run for our lives. I'm all for that. They took off, and just as they got to the front door... Ah! I can't take this anymore. Hello? By the way, don't even think about leaving your house. Okay. He said we can't leave. We better stay here, then. We don't want to make him mad. No. They quickly ran back to Millard's bedroom to hide under the bed. But unfortunately, when they ran off, they didn't stop to close the... Front door! Ah! They waited under the bed, terrified. Their eyes were open wide with fear. Try to be quiet. Shh. You too. Shh. Don't blink. Did you hear that? That was me. I had to blink. Sorry. Well... We've had some close scrapes together, haven't we? Yeah. Goodbye, Sully. Goodbye, Millard. It was good to know you. It was good to know you, too. <laughs> Sully looked at Millard. It's your door. Oh. Just then, they heard the door squeak. And then they heard footsteps. Hello? It was a short guy with thick glass. Wh who's there? I'm Carlisle from the phone company. I'm here to fix your phone once and for all. Huh? I'm really sorry about this. It makes everyone who calls sound really low and mean, doesn't it? I must not have installed it right the first time I was here. Probably got a couple of wires flipped. Thanks for staying at home to let me in. Wait a minute. You're the guy who's coming over? Well, yes. I've been calling and reminding you for the past couple of days. Slowly, Millard and Sully stepped out from under the bed. You're the... He's the guy! He's the guy! <laughs> He's, He's the guy! guy. He's, He's the guy! guy. He's, He's the guy! guy. <laughs> you should have seen how scared you were, Millard. You should have seen how scared you were, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> we hid under the kitchen table all night. <laughs> you wouldn't even go get blankets. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you didn't want to either. Well, yeah, but I did. <laughs> Almost didn't, though. <laughs> that day, Millard and Sully learned an important lesson about fear. We did? What was that? Well, that sometimes things that make us afraid aren't really that scary at all. Oh, yeah. Boy, we've had quite a week. Sully, I'm glad you were there to make it less scary for me. And I'm glad you were there to make it less scary for me, Millard. And they also learned an important lesson about friendship. Really, though? You should have seen how scared you were. <laughs> you should have seen how scared you were. Oh, boy. Oh, you were scared -er. No, you were. Oh, no, you were. Oh, you, your eyes no, were like, were like, no, oh, come on. Your, your fur was standing all straight up on end. But you were shivering so well, much. I, that's it was cold. like I had to adjust the fine tuning or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny. Well. Finally, our last story is called Katie Sings the Blues. Here we go. You know, one of the ways we show gratitude is by learning to be content with what we have. Which is not always an easy lesson to learn, especially when you're only six years old. But that's exactly the lesson Katie Snuffleson learned in our next story. Katie? Well, yes, Marvie. I thought these stories were about me. Oh, well, when this particular story happened, you were away at summer camp. So this one's about your little sister, Katie. Hello. Uh, what a ripoff. Actually, Katie really wanted to go to summer camp, too, but she wasn't old enough. Marvie gets to have all the fun. If I got to have all the fun, I'd be in today's story. And on top of that, Katie couldn't even go play in her room because the Snufflesons were remodeling the house and her room was under heavy construction. I've asked for a marble archway with a rotunda and a skylight. But Katie was growing a little impatient. What could possibly be taking so long? They've been in there over an hour. Katie wandered up to Marvie's room and sat on his bed. Just then, she noticed it was starting to rain outside. I sure hope they sealed in the skylight. Then it began to rain really hard. Perfect. Marvie goes to camp and I stay home and it starts raining. Soon the whole backyard was flooded. On the other hand, Marvie's camping and it's raining. Katie grinned. Boy, it's really coming down out there. Katie jumped up on Marvie's bed just as a giant wave crashed in through an open window. It picked up Katie and the bed, spun them around the room, and washed them out of the window and off onto the high seas. When Katie woke up, she was on the beach of a beautiful island, Razzleflabbin Island. Olaf and Carl, two of the Razzleflabbins, saw Marvie's bed and ran over to it. Marvie! Katie looked up and saw the strange-looking creatures for the first time. <coughs> Olaf and Carl looked at Katie and realized she wasn't Marvie. Ah! Who are you? Who are you? I'm Katie, Marvie's sister. We're Olaf and Carl. Well, well I'm Olaf, Olaf and, and he's Carl. Carl. Well, I'm Carl, he's Carl and, he's and I'm Olaf. Olaf. 
That's, That's true. true. And you are? I told you, I'm Katie. Ah! I think we've been over this. That's true. So where's Marvy? He's at summer camp. Marvy got to go to summer camp? Please, don't rub it in. How come you didn't go? I'm not old enough. Well, Katie, you've come to the right place, because here on Razzle Flavin Island, we happen to have a couple of very nice summer camps. Wow, can I go? Am I old enough? I'm sure there's a camp that's perfect for your age. Of course there is. Just head straight down the trail. The camps are at the end of the path. Thank you. By the way, Katie, uh, on the way you'll pass this cage, whatever you do, don't open it. I know. You know? Marvy told me all about it. Katie set off down the path. Sure enough, it wasn't long before she came upon the cage. Hello? Is anyone there? Nice try. Katie walked on. I got serious camping to do. Soon she arrived at the end of the path. There were two gates, one on the left and one on the right. And each gate had hanging above it a sign. The one on the left said, Marvy's camp. And the one on the right said, Katie's camp. I can read that. Of course, it didn't take long for Katie to figure out which camp she wanted to go to. Marvy's camp. Katie started to go through the gate. But standing on the other side was a razzleflabbin named Bert. Hold on there, little lady. Huh? You can't come in here. You gotta be Marvy's age to come into this camp. What do you mean? Where did Marvy go when he was my age? Why, Katie's camp, of course. What do you think? I can't believe this. No matter where I go, I can't do what Marvy gets to do. Just then, Bert noticed it was time for him to judge the potato sack races. Oops, gotta get going. Now listen, little lady. The camp for youngers like you is Katie's camp. You're not old enough to go to Marvy's camp. But you have fun now. And with that, Bert ran off. Yahoo! Hold on, you bunch of wild little tater tots. I'm a-coming. Katie stood frustrated as she watched Bert run off. I'm tired of being six. At least once in my life, I've got to do something that Marvy gets to do. She took one last look at the signs and stepped boldly into Marvy's camp. Hold on, little tater tots. She started walking down the same path she saw Bert go down. There were lots of beautiful trees and flowers and even a few rocks and logs she had to hop over. This isn't so bad. I don't know why they make such a big deal about it. Just then, she came upon a beautiful bubbling brook. Wow. And like the rest of the obstacles in the path, she had to cross the brook to get to the other side where the path continued. She saw a sign that said, The rule is you must jump across the brook to get to the other side. No wading across. Piece of cake. As Katie stepped out to cross the brook, she looked down. She could see why there was no wading allowed. It was 75 feet deep, and that was at the shallow part. At first, she thought maybe if she took a running jump, she might make it. On the other hand, there's not much margin for error. She looked around and spotted another path leading in a different direction. Great. I'll go this way. This isn't so tough. Hold on, little tater tots. She headed off down the new path, skipping as she went. I'm playing in Marvy's camp. I'm playing in Marvy's camp. Na, 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 na. But before long, she noticed that this path led into the ocean. There was a sign that said, No wading across. Hmm, I bet Marvy jumps the brook. Katie decided to go back to the brook and give it a try. 75 feet isn't that deep when you think about it. On the other hand, maybe I better not think about it. When she got back to the brook, she gave herself one last bit of encouragement. Anything Marvy can do, I can do almost as good. She jumped as high and as far as she could. Here I go! Screaming as she flew through the air. At first, it looked like she was going to barely make it. But then, uh -oh. she hit the water with a splash and immediately started floating downstream. She reached out just in time to catch a fallen tree branch that was hanging over the edge of the water. Help! Olaf and Carl, who were hiking nearby, heard Katie's cry. Carl, did you hear something? It sounded like Katie calling for help. Katie? <laughs> well, it can't be Katie. We're in Marvy's camp. That's true. Katie's not old enough to be in this camp. And it's not like the camps aren't clearly labeled. Help! Carl and Olaf looked at each other. What do you think? It's Katie. Let's, Let's go. go. Carl and Olaf ran to the brook and found Katie clinging to the branch for dear life. Here, we'll help you. Just as Carl and Olaf reached out for Katie's hand, the branch broke. Whoa! Sending Katie and the branch crashing down the river. Hang on, Katie. We're on our way. You should have obeyed the signs. Not now, Carl. Sorry. Olaf and Carl ran down the side of the river after Katie. Just ahead, they noticed Katie was fast approaching the edge of a giant waterfall. This could get messy. As Katie was floating to the waterfall, she noticed a whole bunch of youngsters laughing and playing ring around the razzleflabbin. They were in Katie's camp. That place is looking better all the time. Olaf looked at Carl. What do you think, Carl? The rope? Well, I don't enjoy coiling it back up again, but okay. Olaf reached into his back pocket where he kept his Swiss Army knife, his Coleman lantern, and an extra long coil of rope. What happened to the tent? I left in a hurry. You call yourself an eagle scout. You're right, you're right. <sighs> Olaf quickly tied one of his famous lasso knots. Let's see, now this, this end goes around and over here. No, right? no, that's a sheep shank. You're right, that's, that's a mm -hmm. sheep shank. Okay, yeah. so then it would be through this side 
Uh, let's see. No, 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 no that's no, not look. it. The rabbit goes. What? The rabbit goes, goes round, round and round, round and about. about. No, that's, no, that's not, not it either. either. Hmm. When Olaf finally finished, just throw it to her. You're right. Olaf twirled the rope around and threw it out toward Katie. Katie was just about to go over the edge. She screamed. Ah! But just at the last second, the rope caught her. Did I mention he was an Eagle Scout? Thank you, Carl. Olaf and Carl pulled Katie. Whew. Thank you. You saved my life. Katie, what are you doing here in Marvy's camp? This could be dangerous for someone your age. I just wanted to do what Marvy gets to do, but I think I may be too young for this camp. Once Katie dried off, Olaf and Carl helped her find her way back to the entrance of the camp. Wallet making, horseshoes, arts and crafts, this is more my speed. Katie couldn't wait to check out the camp that was especially for kids her age. Hold on, little tater tots. Then she looked up and thought to herself, I wonder what that means. Katie played and played for the rest of the day until the sun started to go down. Then Olaf and Carl walked her back to Marvy's bed and said their goodbyes. Bye, Katie. Nice Bye. meeting you, Katie. Come back again soon. I'll see you all later. Olaf and Carl walked back to their homes. So the rabbit goes in. And the rabbit, the rabbit goes, goes out. out. The rabbit goes round and around. Maybe it needs to be the rabbit goes round and around and around, and then the and, rabbit goes through. And over the top. And over the top. No, no that's, that's not, not it either. As Katie drifted off to sleep, a gentle wave picked up Marvy's bed and carried her off to sea. When she woke up, she was back in Marvy's room. And she'd learned a very important lesson about being content. You know, it's okay that I don't get to do everything Marvy does. Just then, her dad walked by. Hi, Dad. How's my rotunda coming? Hold on, little tater tot. Okay, big tater tot. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for Lost and Learn. Hope you come back again soon for more fun with Jungle Jam and the Razzle Flappers. Bye bye. And welcome to Laugh and Learn with Jungle Jam and the Razzle Flabbins. Our first story is called The Terrible Truth About Lying. Here we go. Did I ever tell you about Marvy Snuffleson? Hello. Marvy loved going to school. <laughs> it's not bad. He enjoyed finding out about new and exciting things, learning to read and write, and playing with the other kids. <laughs> it's not bad. In fact, he enjoyed school so much, he didn't even mind that there was a big math test today. There's a math test today? Ah! Marvy, are you okay? I think I'm sick, Dad. Marvy's dad came upstairs to see what was going on. Hmm, well, you don't have a temperature. I can feel one coming on, though. Ugh, it's a stomachache, Dad. Have I ever had the mumps? Dad, is that you? I love you, Dad, never at the end. Well, Marvy, we better not take any chances. Maybe you better stay home from school, if you think you're sick. School, Dad? Miss school? What about college? I need my grades for scholarships. No, it's supposed to hide in wet weather if you're sick. But if you're not sick... Dad? Dad? Where'd you go? I can't see you. Dad? It's okay, Marvy. Lie back and get some rest. Thanks, Dad. You're a caring man. Marvy heard his dad walk back downstairs. Yes! Pretty soon, Marvy heard the rain start falling outside and thought maybe he should close his window. Before he could get up, it began to rain really hard. In fact, Marvy didn't remember ever hearing it rain that hard before. Well, maybe once. It sounded like the whole yard was flooding. Marvy looked up from his pillow just in time to see a big wave washing his open window. It picked up his bed and spun it around the room. Whoa! He held on with all his might as a giant wave carried him and his bed right out the open window and off onto the high seas. Whoa! When Marvy woke up, he found himself on a beautiful island beach. This beats a math test any day. Just then, he saw some round and furry things walking toward him on the beach. It was Olaf and Carl, two of the Razzleflamins. Marvy, what are you doing here? This is a school day. Just then, a whole bunch of other Razzleflamins walked up. Marvy, is that you? Is that Marvy? But it's a school day. Um, well, um, my school is closed today. I went there hoping to learn and stuff, but there was a closed sign on the door. Just then, all the Razzleflamins looked at Marvy with terror in their eyes. <laughs> It's horrible. Marvy was scared, too. What is? Where? Where? Marvy looked everywhere but couldn't see what they were screaming about. What? <laughs> then Marvy noticed they were looking at him. Me? You're yelling at me? Look, if it's the school day thing, I wouldn't have gone anyway because I wasn't feeling very well. The Razzleflabbins yelled even louder. <laughs> now it's even worse. Seriously. I was so sick I couldn't even see straight. I couldn't find my way to the bus stop even if I tried to go. <laughs> 
some of the razzle started to faint. <laughs> oh my, well, I was scared too. In fact, I was so scared, my heart stopped beating, and they had to rush me to the hospital. It took 15 specialists to revive me. Then they had to give me a baboon's heart. <laughs> my cousin has a baboon heart. That's different, your cousin is a baboon. Nevertheless, a baboon heart. That's true. Besides, my teacher said I was so smart, I don't have to go back to school for at least a couple of years. At least until the other kids have a chance to catch up. All the Razzaflabbins continued screaming and ran for their lives. Soon Marby was left alone on the beach. Well, it was good to see all of you, too. Eventually, Marby decided to wander into the village and try to figure out what was going on. On his way, he came across a Razzaflabbin who immediately, upon seeing Marby, screamed. Look, I know you're shocked to see me here on a school day, but uh, the president needed me to stay home and give him advice on some very important matters, foreign affairs and stuff. Again, the Razzle Flabbin <laughs> screamed in shock that was even worse. and fainted. <laughs> Marvie was shocked and frightened and ran to try to get help. Help! Help! Just then, two emergency rescue Razzle Flabbins came running up with a stretcher. This is crazy. It's the 14th fainting Razzle Flabbin since 1 o'clock. What time do you have? One after one. Almost. Just then, Marvy stepped up. Oh, thank heaven you're here! The emergency rescue Razzaflabbins were used to seeing some pretty scary things, so they didn't faint. But they did grab the other Razzaflabbin and run back to the village toward the hospital, making siren sounds with their voices. This is awful! The Razzaflabbins have never acted like this before! What could possibly be so scary? Marvy couldn't understand why everyone was so scared of him. It made him so sad, he actually began to feel sick. He went to the hospital to see if a doctor could help him. An orderly, who never saw Marvy because he never looked up from his work, told Marvy, You can't get into the hospital because all the beds are filled with razzleflabbins who fainted because they saw a monster. And every time they wake up, they remember the monster and faint again. Oh, that's awful! Have a nice day. Marvy left the hospital with his head hanging down. He was very sad. This was his worst experience on Razzleflabbin Island ever. Well, there was this one time. Meanwhile, some of the stronger Razzleflabbins woke up from fainting and decided they had to go take care of this monster once and for all. They organized a search party. Let's see, it's best not to go out alone, so Carl and Lars, you go together. And how many are left? Twenty? The rest of you come with me. We'll follow Carl and Lars. Let's go. And went on a monster hunt. Before long, they spotted Marvy and began chasing him. There he is! Let's get him! <laughs> All right, all right, everyone stay together. It's probably best if we form a straight line. Marvy started to run, but the Razzleflabbins caught up with him and surrounded him. Wait a minute. Why are you guys chasing me? Because you're a monster, and on Razzleflabbin Island, when we see a scary monster, we have two choices. We can chase him away, or we can scream and faint. Mm -hmm. We tried the screaming and fainting, but eventually the hospitals were just too full. But I'm not a monster. I'm Marvy. We're friends, remember? Marvy? He says he's Marvy. You look exactly like Marvy, and then he turned into a monster right before our eyes. He's not Marvy. How do you know Marvy, and what have you done with him? I'm telling you, I am Marvy. If you're Marvy, what are you doing here on a school day? Uh, <laughs> <answer> that. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> right. Got him now. Got him now. <laughs> Marvy was so frightened, he forgot to lie about being sick and told the Razzleflabbins the truth. I told my dad I was sick so I could stay home from school. No sooner had Marvy told the truth than he began to look like himself again. Look! He's turning back into Marvy. Marvy, it is you. That's what I said. I keep telling you I'm not a monster. How do you know the monster and what have you done with him? Huh? Never mind. Welcome back. But why were you looking so scary? I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. The only reason someone would turn into a scary monster is if they told a lie. Don't be ridiculous, Mars. No, of course not. We're his friends. Right, right Marvy? You, you wouldn't, wouldn't lie, lie to us. us. No, never. Ah, he's a monster again! Wait, wait, no, I, I did lie. Instantly, the Razzleflabbins knew what was going on. You see, Marvy, on this part of Razzleflabbin Island, when you don't tell the truth, you turn into a monster. But I'm not a monster! Yes, but when you lie, people see you for something you're not. Marvy felt terrible for having told a lie. He quickly apologized and asked his friends to forgive him. Of course we will. Certainly. But please, always tell the truth. We like how you look so much better this way. By the way, why did you stay home from school? I had a math test. Math test? <laughs> oh no, are you guys all right? That's a, that was pretty scary. Yes, but even if you are having a math test, 
It's still always best to tell the truth. Yes, uh, but don't don't feel like you have to say it again. <laughs> I mean, you know, for our benefit. <laughs> Marvy and the Razzleflabbins played together for the rest of the day. They had a wonderful time, and Marvy was very careful only to tell the truth. That night, the Razzleflabbins walked Marvy back to his bed. It was great to see you again, Marvy. It was great to see you too. I guess I'd better climb back into my bed so I can float back home. I've got a little explaining to do, you know. Yes, and it is getting late. Good night, Marvy. Bye. Good night. Marvy crawled up into his bed and watched them walk off. And slowly, he drifted off to sleep. Then a gentle wave pushed Marvy's bed back out to sea. When Marvy woke up, he was in his room. And the very first thing he did was apologize to his father for lying and told him the truth. Marvy's father thanked Marvy for being honest. By the way, how long have I been in bed, Dad? About an hour. You know, you slept right through breakfast. Marvy's dad drove him to school, and Marvy got there just in time for his math test. Ah! <sighs> that was fun, but we're just getting started. Our next story is titled "Lest Ye Be Judged." Here we go. I'm sure I've told you about Marvy Snuffleson. Hi there. Marvy had lots of toys. And he loved each and every one of them, but of all his toys, the one he loved best, at least that particular week, was his T-Rex action figure. Extra claws and teeth sold separately. T-Rex was his pride and joy, and all of Marvy's friends really liked him too, especially little Ian. He's great, Marvy. I know. But Marvy never allowed Ian or anyone, for that matter, to play with or even touch T-Rex. You never know where their hands have been. One afternoon, Ian was watching Marvy play with T-Rex when Marvy decided to go inside and get a glass of water. Because. Playing dinosaurs can build up quite a thirst if you do it right. But before he went in, he set T Rex up on a tree and gave Ian some strict instructions. Don't play with him, hold him, or touch him. Understand? Yeah. Can I look at him? You're gonna wear him out. Well, okay, but only in brief glimpses. Brief. Ian agreed, and Marvy went inside. And as soon as he did, a strong gust of wind whipped up the street, shaking the tree where T Rex was sitting. T Rex fell out of the tree and landed right on his head. Which broke off from his body and skidded to a stop at Ian's feet. Horrified, Ian picked up T Rex's head and body just as Marvy came back outside. Ian, what did you do? I I didn't do anything. You broke T Rex. No, it blew out of the tree and fell to the ground. Oh sure, you expect me to believe that when you're holding the pieces? But I didn't do it, Marvy. You gotta believe me. Go home, Ian. Just go away. Ian ran home very upset. And Marvy went inside and stomped upstairs to his room, the nearly empty glass of water still in his hand. He set the glass down in his nightstand and plopped down onto his bed. And when he did, he accidentally knocked over the glass, spilling the water. This just isn't my day. He started to clean it up, but the water kept on spilling. Then it started gushing out of the glass. Marvy couldn't ever remember seeing water spill out of a glass that fast before. Well, maybe a few times. No, never. Soon the whole bedroom was flooded. The water rose higher and higher. It picked up Marvy's bed, spun it around the room, and then carried it out of his window and onto the open sea. When Marvy woke up, he found himself on the beautiful, peaceful beach of Razzleflabbin Island, where no one breaks your T-Rex. But the beach wasn't peaceful for long, for as soon as Marvy hopped off his bed, one of the strange-looking Smiven Bibbin came running toward him. <laughs> Oh, no. The Smiven Bibbin was carrying a big rectangular package. On his head was a beanie cap with a little propeller on it, and on his feet were a pair of shoes that looked exactly like the ones Marvy was wearing. High top super tennies. <laughs> the Smiven Bibbin ran right up to Marvy. <laughs> whoa, whoa, who are you? Marvy. Hi, Marvy. I'm Snork. Here, hold this. <laughs> Snork held out his package. Marvy took it, and as soon as he did, Snork laughed maniacally, <laughs> started the propeller on his cap, contact, <laughs> and zoomed away. <laughs> Marvy was stunned. He yelled, "Snork! Look out! You'll see him later!" <laughs> But Snork was already out of sight. Marvy barely had time to catch his breath when suddenly all sorts of sirens, bells, and whistles went off behind him. What in the world? Marvy turned around only to see dozens of Razzleflabbins rushing at him from every direction. There he is! Caught him red-handed. The Razzleflabbins surrounded Marvy, taking the package from him and grabbing his arms. What's going on? Who are you? Marvy demanded. An official-looking Razzleflabbin stepped up to him. I'm Officer Clint. You're under arrest. Under arrest? For what? You know what for? This is one of our most priceless treasures, next to the three guys from Italy restaurant. He ripped the wrapping from the package. The portrait of Ingmar Razzleflab, Razzleflabbin Island. <laughs> And you stole it. Da, 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 da. Stole it? 
No. Then how come you have it? A smithin' bivin named Snort gave it to me. Yeah, yeah, save it for the judge. The judge? Yes, the judge. Clint and the other Razzleflabbin police took Marby directly to the Razzleflabbin Hall of Justice, where a jury already sat waiting for him. There he is. Such a nice boy. Norman Joe. Lousy teeth. Oh. I know they're going to be fair. Hello, I'm Carl. I'll be your prosecutor today. Carl! And I do hope you'll forgive me for nailing your hide to the wall. You mean, you think I'm guilty? Think? <laughs> nice seeing you again, Marvy. Isn't anybody defending me? Uh, yes, uh, Marvy, I am. Olaf, thank goodness. At least someone around here thinks I'm innocent. Innocent? Oh. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I think you're guilty, too. No, I was appointed by the court. I, I had no choice, really. All rise. Razzle Flavin Court is now in session. The Honorable Justice Burt presiding. Be seated. Yeah, I know the evidence seems overwhelming, but this is going to be a fair trial. Now, where is the dirty, rotten thief? Uh, I object to that description, Your Honor. My client is not dirty. You're right, you're right. Objection sustained. Now, let's get on with it. Kyle, make your opening statement. Your Honor, I simply intend to prove that Marvy Snuffleson is guilty, guilty, guilty! No offense, Marvy. Thank you. Your turn, Olaf! Uh, I don't think I can top that, Your Honor. What? Well, he did do a great job. Thank you, Olaf. But... Call your first witness, Kyle. And so the trial got underway. I call as my first witness, Sven Ingersoll. Marvy had a hopeful feeling as Sven was sworn in and took the stand. Sven is my friend. I helped him when we first met. Sven, isn't it true that Marvy Snuffleson almost caused you to drown? Well, yes, it is, but... Thank you, your witness. No questions. No questions? Well, you did do that, didn't you? Yes, but it's not the way it sounds. No questions. Next witness! This is unbelievable. And things only got worse. Marvy sat in disbelief as each of his Razzleflabbin friends came to the stand and told of how Marvy had disrupted the island. He made my games, my food, and me disappear because he was ungrateful. <gasps> he let out the disobedience, Maven Beaven. <gasps> he told a lie and turned into a monster. <gasps> oh. He tried to eat at the Three Guys from Italy restaurant without wearing socks. <gasps> Finally, after all of Carl's witnesses had been called, Bert the Judge turned to Olaf. All right, Olaf, call your witness. Any, Your Honor. What? What about me? Oh, well, all right, if you really want to. <clears throat> I know I've done some not-so-good things in the past, but I've learned my lesson. <laughs> and no matter how it looks, I didn't take the painting. <laughs> I know you caught me with it, but that's because a smith and Bivin named Snork had just handed it to me. <laughs> he was wearing shoes exactly like mine. That's why there was only one set of footprints in the sand. <laughs> And you couldn't find him because he had a beanie cap with a propeller on it. And he zoomed away before you came up. <laughs> You've got to believe me. But the Razzleflabbins just continued to laugh. And suddenly, Marvy remembered where he had heard that phrase before. You've got to believe me. That's what Ian said about breaking my T-Rex. Bert pounded his gavel. All right, all right, order in the court. It's time for the jury to go out and make a decision. Guilty or not guilty? Marvy watched as the jury filed out of the courtroom. And then filed right back in again. He's guilty, Your Honor! Guilty! 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 No! Will the defendant rise? Marvy Snuffleson, I hereby sentence that you be banished from Razzle Flabbin Island forever! Bert the judge raised his gavel solemnly. But just as he was about to bring it down, everyone heard a small propeller motor sputter and cough above them. They all looked up as the motor abruptly quit. And Snork, the smithin' ribbon, plummeted into the courtroom with a thud. It's Snork! How can we be sure? Well, for one thing, he's wearing the exact same shoes as I am. <gasps> he's also got on a beanie cap with a propeller on top. <gasps> and last but not least, he's holding another portrait. Oh. He's right. It's the portrait of Ingrid, Ingmar's wife. Of course! I wanted a matching set! Take him away, boys. Well, Marvy, looks like you're not guilty. Yay! 
Everyone cheered, and Mari breathed a huge sigh of relief. Phew! The Razzleflabbins were glad to have the portraits of Ingmar and Ingrid, the founders of Razzleflabbin Island, back in their rightful place. Ingmar and Ingrid's house, of course. They live right down the street. They're a lovely couple. As the sun went down, the Razzleflabbins walked Marvy back to his bed on the beach. Sorry for all we put you through, Marvy. Oh, that's all right. I think I understand now why you shouldn't accuse someone of something until you have all the facts. Marvy and the Razzleflabbins all said goodbye to each other. Goodbye, Marvy! Bye! Marvie. Marvie. Bye. Bye. Then Marvy crawled up into his bed and watched them walk off. Slowly, he drifted off to sleep as a gentle wave pushed Marvy's bed back out to sea. When he woke up, the first thing Marvy did was rush outside to find Ian. I'm sorry, Ian. That's okay. Look! Ian held up T-Rex, who was as good as new. You fixed him. Yeah, his head snapped right back on. Great! Marvy thanked Ian, and then they both started playing with T-Rex. Together. By the way, Marvy, extra heads sold separately. Finally, our last story is called This Island Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us. You know, I really can't say enough about that Marvy Snuffleson. Hi. Believe it or not, one of Marvy's favorite subjects at school was geography. Believe it. He knew the location of countries, states, and rivers like the back of his hand. The Monongahela is located in northwest Virginia and southwest Pennsylvania. Or is that a freckle? Yes, Marvy really enjoyed geography. Until he was picked to participate in the school-wide geography bee and found out who his opponent was. Buster Conklin? At your service. Buster was the school bully. And he was tough. If you consider shaving at 11 tough. Buster was also terrible at geography. He made it to the finals by threatening all of the kids he came up against. It's simple. You can either give me the right answers and let me win, or I can make you breathe through your ears. The choice is yours. So it came as no surprise when Buster approached Marvy in the classroom on the morning they were to face off. You know, Snuffleson, losing makes me really angry. You wouldn't want me to get angry, would you, Snuffleson? No. Well, the only way to prevent that is to give me the answers and let me win. Otherwise, I hope your health insurance is paid up. Think about it, Snuffleson. Marvy sat down very depressed. He knew he shouldn't give in to Buster. On the other hand, what's a few geography answers when my personal safety is involved? Marvy sighed and put his head down on his desk. Then he noticed Becky Fahrenheimer getting a drink at the drinking fountain. Marvy watched the fountain as she walked away. Curiously, the water kept running. Suddenly, it started gushing. Marvy couldn't ever remember seeing water rush that fast before. At least, not out of the fountain. Soon, the whole classroom was flooded. Marvy grabbed his desk and held on tight as the water picked it up, spun it around the room, and carried it out of an open window and onto the high sea. When Marvy woke up, he was still out on the high sea, but he was floating towards the beautiful shore of Razzleflabbin Island. Where there's no Buster Conklin. The island was still a good distance away, but Marvy could see that something unusual was happening. A huge creature with leathery skin, an eye patch, and a furry belly was standing on the beach. Several frightened Razzleflabbins were approaching him with a wagon full of three guys from Italy, eggplant parmigiana. What's that all about? Marvy wondered. But just then, a huge wave picked up his desk and hurled it rapidly toward the island. Whoa! Marvy and his desk flew through the air and crashed right into the creature who toppled headlong into the wagon, scattering the razzleflabbins and sending eggplant parmigiana flying in all directions. When everyone finally came to their senses, Marvy was sitting on the creature's chest. The creature peered through the slit of its unpatched eye at Marvy. Who are you? Marvy? Who... Or what are you? The creature jumped up, knocking Marvy to the sand, and glared at him angrily. I'm Larango Kid, leader of the Sidewinding Furbellies. Sidewinding Furbellies? By now, Carl, Olaf, and the other Razzleflabbins had run up to Marvy. Yes, Marvy, the Sidewinding Furbellies. Didn't they break up in the 60s? No, Marvy, that was the Furwinding Sidebellies. The Sidewinding Furbellies are the meanest, nastiest, orneriest, most hateful, and despicable creatures in these parts. (laughs) Of course, I'm I'm just repeating the rumors. (laughs) So that's your plan. Huh? Sending this little squirt to sneak up on me from behind. But we didn't send him to sneak up on you, uh, Mr. Furbelly. We, in fact, we hardly know him. What was your name again? Never mind the fancy talk. You all think you're pretty smart, don't you? Well, we'll just see how smart you are. What are you going to do? I'm going to get my brothers. And when we get back, you best have all the eggplant parmesan ready for us. And if and you don't, then you better get used to calling this place... 
Sidewinding fur belly island. <laughs> and with that, he skipped off, beating on his chest to make the sound of horses' hooves. Marvy was completely confused. Will somebody please tell me what this is all about? Well, it's very simple, Marvy. We have a contract with the Sidewinding Fur Bellies. Yes, we've agreed to give them 25% of our eggplant parmigiana every month. And in return, they've agreed not to take over our island. Take it over? We were just about to conclude our monthly deal when you and your desk crashed in on us. So now we have to give them all of our eggplant parmigiana. Unless you like the idea of coming to a place called Sidewinding Fur Belly Island. I think I could get used to it, you know, if I had to. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you're paying these guys off. I wouldn't call it paying them off. No, it's more like extortion. Yes. Whatever you call it, it isn't right. Well, that's all well and good for you to say, Marvy. You only vacation here. But you shouldn't put up with that kind of abuse. What kind of abuse should we put up with? None. You should stand up to the sidewinding fur bellies. But, Marvy, they have sticks and stones. You can get sticks and stones. They have clubs and chains. You can get clubs and chains. They have big, bulging muscles. You can get clubs and chains. Look, you have to do something. I don't think we can, Marvy. You see, we're afraid. We need somebody brave to confront the fur bellies. Someone who has actually gotten the best of them before. Somebody, somebody like, like... Like you, Marvy. Me? You sat on Lorango's chest. That's better than any of us have ever done. But that was an accident. All in favor of making Marvy Sheriff say aye. Aye. Opposed? The eyes have it. Congratulations, Marvy. But I don't want to be Sheriff. Heading Fur Belly Island. Please do it, Marvy. Please. Okay, I'll do it. Good. And just in the nick of time, too. Here they come! Marvy looked up and saw Lorango and his brothers walking towards them. The Razzleflabbin screamed and ran for cover, leaving Marvy all alone. He was not happy. Why should I do this? This isn't even my island. I should run away. Or better yet, sit at my desk and float back out a great idea. And that's just what he started to do. But when he turned around, he saw the terrified faces of the Razzleflabbins peering at him hopefully. We love you, Marvy! They look so... helpless. Marvy realized the Razzleflabbins were depending on him, and at that moment he knew he had to stay. He turned back around just as the fur bellies walked up. Marvy's knees were shaking, but he swallowed hard and forced himself to take a step forward. That's far enough, boys. The fur bellies stopped. Hey. Lorango scowled. Hey, you again? That's right. The Razzleflabbins have elected me sheriff. Sheriff? <laughs> did you hear that, Durango? <laughs> I sure did, Lorango. That's a great one, eh, Hives? <laughs> yalla, yalla, yalla. Ripping, simply ripping. <laughs> well, Sheriff, you got the eggplant parmesan already? No, we don't. Then I hope everybody's used to calling this place Sidewinding Fur Belly Island. We're not going to do that either. Y you're not? No! You've been scaring the Razzleflabbins long enough. Now, I know you're bigger and tougher and meaner than I am, but if you want to take over this island, you'll have to go through me to do it. The sidewinding fur bellies looked confused. Then Lorango said, You mean you're not just going to let us take over? No. Nobody's ever done that before. Can we take over part of the island? No. But we already had maps drawn up. Yeah, and stationery. And embossed business cards. Do you know how much embossing costs? I don't care. You're not taking over. Well, do you know of another island that we could take over? It has to look like this one, though, so we don't waste the maps. No, I don't. But I want you off this island now. All right, all right. We're going. I knew we shouldn't have embossed. Impatient little guy, isn't he? You think maybe we could have a little eggplant parmigiana for the road? No. Now go! All right, all right. All we're right, going. Okay, okay. The fur bellies we took go. off. Marvy breathed a huge sigh of relief. Phew. And the Razzleflabbins ran up to him, cheering joyously. Hooray! Marvy, you were great. Thanks for being so brave. I didn't feel brave. I felt really scared, and I almost ran away. Why did you stay? I don't know. I knew it was the right thing to do, so I just did it. And maybe that's what I have to do with Buster, too. Three chairs for Marvy. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Yeah, was that, uh, was that three? No, that's only two. All right, uh, one more. Hip, hip, hooray! The Razzleflabbins were so grateful to Marvy, they prepared a huge feast in his honor. And the main dish, of course, was eggplant parmigiana. Which is second to none. The feast lasted well into the afternoon. Finally, as the sun was going down, the Razzleflabbins walked Marvy back to his desk on the beach. They said goodbye to each other. Bye, Marvy! Bye! And Marvy sat in his chair and put his head down on the desktop. He watched as the Razzleflabbins walked off and then closed his eyes as a gentle wave pushed his desk back out to sea. Marvy awoke to someone shaking him roughly. 
It was Buster. Stop staring into space and answer me, Snuffleson. You gonna give me the answers or do I have to pound ya? Marvy slowly rose to his full height, looked Buster squarely in the throat, and said, No, Buster. I'm not gonna give you the answers. All right, then. You and me, after school. Name the place. Marvy told Buster to meet him in the little vacant lot behind the Johnson's house up the street from the school. Say goodbye to your face, Snuffleson. Buster walked off. <sighs> Marvy sighed. This worked a lot better on Razzle Flavin Island. As expected, Marvy won the geography bee. Washington, D.C. is in the United States. And that afternoon, he went dutifully to the little vacant lot behind the Johnson's house up the street from the school to wait for Buster. I wonder what a body cast feels like. Only, Buster never showed up. Huh? It seems he was so bad at geography, he ended up at the waterfront where he was shanghaied by the merchant marines and shipped off to Madagascar. Which is the fourth largest island located off the southeastern coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean. Thanks for joining us for Laugh and Learn. Hope you come back again soon for more fun with Jungle Jam and the Razzle Flappins. Bye bye! Hi, and welcome to Laugh and Learn with Jungle Jam and the Razzle Flappins. Our first story is called Bjorn Free. Here we go. Did I ever tell you about Marvy Snuffleson? Hi. Marvy was a very good kid. But there was a time when Marvy struggled with... Perfect. The problem was that every time Marvy wanted to do something, his parents had a rule keeping him from doing it. I've heard too many rules can stun a kid's growth. Or was that coffee? And there was one rule he thought particularly silly. Marvy, how many times do I have to tell you, when you go in or out of the backyard, close the gate? I'm not growing. I can feel it. So one day, when he ran from the backyard to the front yard and his dad yelled, Marvy, close the gate. Marvy ignored him and kept right on going. He was pleased with his boldness. Now that's taking control of your life. Until he rounded the corner and ran right into his dad. Oops. Marvy knew undoubtedly where he was going next. My room? Undoubtedly. Once there, Marvy sat on a little chair looked out his window and watched his sister Katie water the backyard lawn. She never has to obey any rules. Just then, the phone rang and Katie went inside to answer it, leaving the water running. Marvy stared at the water glumly. After a few seconds, he noticed it was coming out of the hose really fast. And if I remember seeing water come out of the hose that fast before, well, maybe a few times. No, never. Soon, the whole backyard was flooded. The water rose higher and higher. Marvy leapt onto his bed just as a mountain of water crashed through his window, picked up his bed, and carried it out of the house and onto the open sea. When Marvy woke up, he was on the beach of a beautiful island, Razzleflabbin Island. Hello. And on the beach, coming toward Marvy, was a little Razzleflabbin he'd never seen before. My name is Jan. Hi, I'm Marvy. Well, I'd love to stay and chat, but I gotta be going. See ya. Wait, can you tell me how to get to the others? Oh, sure. You go down this path till you come to a tree that looks like a dinosaur. Turn left. Then you keep going down that path until you come to a dinosaur that looks like a tree. Turn right. By the way, I'd make the second turn quickly. All the others live at the end of that path. Thanks. Oh, there's just one more thing. What? After you pass the dinosaur that looks like a tree, you'll come across a little cage. Now listen to me very carefully, Marvy. No matter what happens, do not open the door to that cage. Why not? Trust me on this, you don't want to know. There'll be signs to remind you, but I want you to promise me that you won't open the door to that cage. Have a nice trip. And with that, Jan walked away, leaving a very curious Marvy behind him. What could possibly be so secret about a little cage? Marvy wondered. Then he shrugged and started down the path. Soon he came to the tree that looked like a dinosaur. A T-Rex, although it could be mistaken for a velociraptor. He turned left and kept walking. After a while, he came across the dinosaur that looked like a tree. A stately elm, although it could be mistaken for a eucalyptus. <laughs> Maybe not. He turned right and quickly kept walking. Sure enough, a few yards down, he saw a small cage set back a ways from the path. The cage was dark inside. So dark, you couldn't even tell if anything was even in it or not. Surrounding the cage were several signs. Talking signs, as a matter of fact. Stay away from the cage. Don't even go near it. And certainly don't talk around it. In fact, don't even think around it. This, this means you, you Marvy Snuffles, on the 801 South Main Street. Marvy was impressed. I've never seen such specific signs before. Suddenly, he heard a friendly voice. Hello? Is anyone there? Marvy knew he'd already said more than he was supposed to when he talked to himself. He was just about to walk on without another word when the voice said, Okay, don't talk. If you want to let a bunch of signs run your life, 
Marby didn't want to let a bunch of signs run his life, but he still wasn't sure about the voice, so very softly he said, Well, the signs are specific. So someone is there. Yeah, but I'm not supposed to talk to you. It's okay, really. My name is Bjorn. What's yours? Marvy. Marvy. That's a great name. Are you a razzle flobbin? Oh, no, I'm, I'm a smivin' bivin'. We live on another island close by. How come you're in a cage? I don't know. I was looking for some new friends to play with, but when I got here, the Razzle Flavins grabbed me and locked me in this cage. I can't believe the Razzle Flavins would be so cruel. Imagine my shock. But they are. Marvy, please let me out, please. Marvy wasn't sure what to do. Suddenly, he remembered what Jan said. No matter what happens, do not open the door to that cage. Marvy started to walk away. But then he heard the unmistakable sound of crying. It was Bjorn. I, j I just wanted to play with new friends and stuff. But no, that'll never happen. No one likes me. Marvy couldn't stand it. He snuck over and gently lifted the latch on the cage door. <laughs> Suddenly, the cry turned into a very strange laugh. <laughs> Marvy tried to close the latch, but it was too late. The cage door burst open, knocking him on his back. There was a low rumble, and suddenly out of the cage sprang the most incredible creature Marty had ever seen. It had huge floppy ears, an extremely long tail, and was covered from head to toe with purple and yellow polka-dotted fur. It wrapped its tail around a nearby tree branch, hoisted itself to the top of the tree, and yelled, Hey, Razzle Flappins! Marvy has just said, Beyond Free! Bjorn jumped down and started kicking over the signs around his cage. Take this! Oh. You know about this? Oh. <laughs> Stop oh. kicking, Bjorn, from Slim and Bivin Island! By now, the Razzle Flabbins were running up. Jan was the first. Marvy, I told you not to open the cage! But he was crying, and I tried to shut it, but he was too quick. Why is he acting that way? Because he's a menace to everyone, including himself. Bjorn is a disobedient Slim and Bivin. Suddenly, Bjorn cackled loudly and ran off. <laughs> Marvy and the Razzle took off after him, but he was too fast for them. Bjorn jumped into the ocean and swam all the way down to the bottom. The sign says, do not pull plug. <laughs> That's all I need to know. <laughs> he pulled the plug, and the whole ocean drained away. Next, he went house to house and found the mattresses in each Razzle Flavin bedroom. On each mattress was a tag that said, Warning, do not remove this tag under penalty of law. Thank you. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> he ripped the tag off every single mattress. This went on for hours as Bjorn broke rule after rule. The Razzle were panic-stricken. They and Marby met in a clearing to decide what to do. This is awful. Simply awful. Razzle Flavin Island will be a terrible place to live if we don't get Bjorn back into the cage. But how are we supposed to do that? He's too fast for us. Marby felt especially bad. This is all my fault. If only I had obeyed the signs. The signs! That's it! Marvy gathered the other Razzle Flavins around him and told them his plan. They agreed it was the best thing to do and immediately put it into action. Later that afternoon, Bjorn was barreling down the path looking for more rules to break when suddenly... There's a group of signs I haven't seen before! His mouth watered in anticipation of the rules he was about to break. But when he got within earshot, the signs began speaking sternly to him. Do not replace the ocean plug. Do not sew the tags neatly back on the mattresses. Bjorn started shaking all over. No, 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 you're gonna ruin my fun! He tried to fight it, but it was no good. Because he was a disobedient Smith and Bibbin, he had to disobey the signs. No! Suddenly, as if pulled by some unseen force, Bjorn sped toward the ocean. Mari and the Razzle who had been watching, followed. They got to the beach just in time to see Bjorn replace the ocean plug. Olaf quickly grabbed the garden hose and began refilling the ocean. This will only take a minute. We've got great water pressure here. Next, Bjorn ran house to house and sewed all the tags neatly back onto the mattresses. That'll only take him a minute. We've, we've got great sewing machines here. Finally, Bjorn came across the sign Marvy made. Do not go back into the cage. This means you, Bjorn, from Smith and Bivin Island. Oh, no! No, 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 no! Don't say that! Oh, please don't! Bjorn rocketed toward the cage and clanged inside. Marvy and the Razzle Flavin slammed the gate shut and locked it tight. They all breathed a huge sigh of relief. Yeah. Razzle Flavin Island slowly returned to normal. 
As the sun began to set, Jan and the others walked Marvy back to his bed on the beach and thanked him for helping them. Even though it was your fault. Marvy, we do appreciate everything you did, so thanks. You're welcome. I'm sorry I didn't obey the signs. I think I understand now why it's so important to obey rules, even if you think they're silly. Marvy climbed onto his bed and they all said goodbye. Goodbye! Goodbye! Slowly, he drifted off to sleep. As a wave gently pushed him back out to sea. When Marvy awoke the next morning, he knew he had to apologize to his parents for disobeying them. He raced out into the backyard as fast as he could. Dad! And this time, he was very careful to close the gate. And it was a good thing he did, too, because watching his every move from across the street was a very large, very mean dog named Bjorn. Oof! 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 <laughs> You know, the jungle's a wonderful place to live. Just ask anyone who lives there. I love this place. It's the best place in the world. Best in the universe. I like the ocean. Silly! Well, I do. But even though it's a great place to live, it's not all fun and games. And that means everyone has a job to do. For instance, Max the giraffe's job is picking fruit off the tops of trees. Look out below! Ouch! Sorry! Gruffy Bear is chief fruit, berry, and pie taster. And brownies! And brownies. And cake, and pizza, and hamburgers, and spaghetti, and goulash, and fettuccine alfredo with just a hint of basil. Love that. <laughs> of course. But since Gruffy is also very strong, his other job is fixing things. Ovens, toasters, ranges, gas grills, blenders, food processors. Can't have those things breaking down. Nozzles the elephant's job is carrying water from the stream. There's a stream around here? I've been hauling these buckets from the ocean. And of course, Nozzles also provides everyone in the jungle with sage advice, intelligent counsel, and penetrating perspectives on the key issues of the day. Did you guys know there was a stream around here? Everyone has a job to do. And each job makes the jungle function smoothly. So when somebody doesn't do their job, it can cause a lot of problems. Which brings us to Jean-Claude the Flying Squirrel. C'est bon! It was Jean-Claude's job to pick up all the dry leaves. Oh, the excitement never stops. He would then put them into bags and set the bags just outside the front of the jungle where they were picked up every Thursday morning. I've always wondered where they go from there. What could it possibly matter? It's not like you can eat them. Hmm, leaves. A little butter, a little lemon, maybe a hint of basil. I'll get back to you. Now, Jean-Claude had been at this job for a long time. Un, deux, trois, un. Uh, which means three years. And as often happens when you've been doing something over and over for a long time, Jean-Claude was frustrated, jaded, and sick to the very core of my being. Beginning to tire of the job. So a few dry leaves fall into the clearing. They add color to the place and make a neat crunching sound when you walk on them. When you eat them, too. And as Jean-Claude considered his situation, a thought occurred to him. I was made for greater things than this. Which means, I was made for greater things than this. I was meant to do something bigger or more important. Uh, which means, I was meant to do something bigger, more important. Jean-Claude, the flying squirrel must not stay on the ground. Jean-Claude must go. Which means, uh, your guess is as good as mine. And the more he thought about it... I am great. I am good. I like moi. The less he thought about doing his job. Until one day... Ah, what a beautiful morning. And I have nothing to do. He forgot about it entirely. What a great day to fulfill my destiny. He didn't even notice the loud crunching sound beneath his feet as he raced to his plane. Oh, is that Gruffy eating again? And soon he was soaring through the air like a bird. A really fast bird. Well, more like a squirrel on a plane. Along the vent de la patrie, à la jour de glory, As he flew, he searched for a task that would fulfill his greatness and soon spotted it. Yowika! Wait a minute. That's not my tune. That's it. Jean-Claude landed, hopped out of his plane, and ran through the ever-growing piles of leaves to Gruffy, who was right in the middle of putting up some drywall. Monsieur Gruffy! Hey, Jean-Claude! What are you doing here? I'm fixing the wall. You are? Well, then what am I doing here? Wait a minute. Fixing things is my job. I will help you. Well... Um, you take the power screwdriver there. Jean-Claude picked up the screwdriver, but it was way too big for him. <laughs> the screwdriver backfired, spun him around, and catapulted him into a nearby pile of leaves. <clears throat> Jean-Claude, are you all right? Oh, where well, am I? You're in a pile of leaves. Lucky for me, it was nearby. Nearby? You can't sneeze around here without hitting a pile of leaves. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> See what I mean? So Gruffy returned to his drywall, and a very dizzy Jean-Claude got up and walked, 
straight into a tree. Oh, la, la. Later that day, he came upon water. I can't believe nobody told me there was a stream in the jungle. Aha! Hauling water! Jean-Claude ran up to Nozzles and tried picking up one of the buckets. Oopsie daisy! It was way too heavy, but that didn't stop him. He tried again, and this time managed to lift it just barely off the ground. That's when Nozzles noticed him. Jean-Claude, what are you doing? Getting the water! But you can't lift that bucket. It's way too heavy for you. Uh-oh, I guess it's time to turn over the tape. See you on the other side. Here, let me have no, it. No, 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 I have it. Let go. There was a bit of a struggle, and since elephants are much bigger than flying squirrels... Jean-Claude ended up soaked. I'm sorry, Jean-Claude. I tried to tell you. This water is much colder than it looks. Why are you trying to help me carry water anyway? I know, I know. That's your job. Jean-Claude waded his way back through the leaves to where he left his airplane. He was not happy. I can't understand it. I know I'm supposed to do a great task. Why can't I find out what it is? Suddenly, he noticed something. Hey, my plane, it is gone. I left it right here with Monsieur Graffy. Then he noticed something else. Monsieur Gruffy is gone too, and so is his cave. It was true. Neither Gruffy, his cave, nor Jean-Claude's plane were anywhere in sight. Frightened, Jean-Claude rushed back to the clearing. I must tell Monsieur Nozzles. But when he got to the clearing... Monsieur Nozzles is also gone, and so is the clearing. In fact, everything was gone, and the only thing Jean-Claude could see was... Leaves, leaves, leaves everywhere. He ran to the top of a nearby leaf hill to get a better view and saw nothing but piles and piles of leaves in every direction. Wow! These trees must be exhausted. Suddenly, he heard a voice. Jean-Claude! Ah, who is it? It's me, Monsieur Nozzles. Where are you? Right here. The hill beneath Jean-Claude moved. Ah, Nozzles, you have changed into a, a large leafy hill thing. I didn't change. The leaves got so deep after a while, I couldn't move, and I got covered. In fact, we all did. All the other leaf piles started moving, too. We were just standing here and got covered. Covered by prickly, muck-coated leaves. Yeah, I kind of like it. Sorry. Well, I do. But how could this have happened? Maybe the jungle's been infected by a mutant strain of wild leaf-multiplying bacteria. Yeah. 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 Or maybe the person responsible for picking up the leaves hasn't been doing his job. Well, yeah, I guess that's possible, too. All right. Who's the wise guy responsible for picking up these leaves? Yes, who is the wise guy responsible for... Oops. I think we have a winner. But how could it have possibly gotten so bad? I just let them go for a few days. How many days? A few. Dozen. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to do something important. We can understand that, Jean-Claude. It's good to want to take on more responsibility. But before you go out looking for something bigger and better, you need to make sure you're doing the job you're supposed to do. Yeah, but it doesn't solve our problem. We're still covered in leaves. How are we going to get rid of them? Suddenly, Jean-Claude had an idea. I know what to do. Never fear, everyone. Jean-Claude has it in the bag. And he did. Literally. Jean-Claude ran back to his home and got all of the big leaf bags he could find. <laughs> he took them to the edge of the jungle and set them up so they would stay open. He then dug out his plane, flew it to the opposite edge of the jungle... <laughs> landed and turned on its propellers full blast. Perhaps don't fail me now. The propellers created a huge gust of wind that blew all the leaves into the open bags at the other end of the jungle. Then Jean-Claude and the other animals quickly tied the bags up and left them outside the front of the jungle for the Thursday morning pickup. I'd still like to know where they go. Jean-Claude never forgot to do his job again. He had learned that the person who is faithful in little things will also be faithful in the big things. Which means that even though a job doesn't seem important, you should still do it to the best of your ability. Even if that job is picking up leaves from the muck and mire. Hmm. Muck? Mire? A little butter? A little lemon? Just a hint of basil. Wow. Talk about your taste sensations. I'll get back to you. da dum da dum 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 How did that tone get in my head? Dum da dum 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 That's it. Finally, our last story is called Raider, a story about procrastination. Here it comes. You know, putting things off needlessly can lead to trouble down the road. And that's a lesson Marvie Snuffleson learned in our next story. I had a feeling it would be. It started one afternoon when Marvie's teacher told his class, Listen up, everyone. Tomorrow we're going to have a math test. 
And of course, we all know how Marvy felt about math tests. <laughs> he really disliked them. It wasn't that he couldn't learn the material, it's just that he couldn't see why he should. I'm going to be a cowboy when I grow up. What does a cowboy need with math? So, even though he knew he should study when he got home from school, Marvy decided instead to go play. Just for a little while, to clear my mind. He was only going to play for a few minutes, but his mind just wouldn't clear for some reason. Strange. In fact, it didn't clear for another hour. Strange. And once it was clear, there was a new problem. Boy, am I hungry. I can't study on an empty stomach. So, he ate a delicious apple. Mmm. Finishing just in time for one of his favorite TV programs. C-SPAN, a Senate filibuster. Wow! Well, hello, Marvy. Dad! Big math test tomorrow, son? How'd you know? You're watching a Strom Thurmond filibuster. You know you need to study. How long do you think you can put it off? I was thinking, mm, maybe till the year 2014? Needless to say, Marvy immediately found himself on his way up to his room. He sat down on his bed and painfully opened his math book. Just then, he heard a bubbling sound. Oh, I forgot to feed my goldfish. Marvy rushed to the fishbowl and sprinkled in some food. The goldfish jumped happily, splashing some water on the desk. Marvy started to clean it up when he noticed that more water was splashing out of the bowl. Wow, you're really happy. Suddenly, it started gushing out all over the floor. The water in the room rose higher and higher. I've got to get back to feeding you on a regular schedule. Soon, the whole room began to flood, and Marvy dove onto his bed just in time as a giant wave came crashing out of the fishbowl and sent Marvy, bed and all, out of his window and onto the open sea. Marvy woke up on the beautiful beach of Razzleflabbin Island. Where no one needs math. Suddenly, Marvy heard... It was Carl and Olaf, two of his Razzleflabbin friends. Hi, guys. Welcome to Razzleflabbin Island Ranch, Pilgrim. And are we glad to see you. We need your help. Really? Who's what? Rounding up doggies. Don't you mean doggies as in cattle? No, we mean doggies as in dogs. Come on. They climbed to the top of a nearby hill, and Marvy looked down the other side. And there below them was a huge herd of dogs. Basset hounds, Weimariners, Dachshunds, Rottweilers, Shelties, Lassa Opsos, with the odd Scotch Border Collie thrown in for good measure. Hurt near 900 head and 75 corrals. Sven and the other Razzleflabbins were riding herd on the doggies. But instead of putting them inside the corrals, the Razzleflabbins just kept herding them around in circles. How come they're not putting them in the corrals? Because Cal's on vacation. Cal? Who's Cal? A friend of ours. He keeps all the facts and figures on the island. Such as how many doggies go in each corral. Each corral has to have an equal number of doggies in it. No more, no less. But only Cal knows what that number is. His absence is causing lots of problems for the ranch. Without him, Lars doesn't know how deep to dig our new eggplant cellar. And Bert can't tell how much French bread with delightful cheese sauce to make so that each of us will have two pieces. Those sound like mass problems. They are. Uh, I gotta go feed my goldfish. Wait, you can't go now. You see, aside from Cal, you're the only one here who's gone to school. And in school, you study mass. Ergo, until Cal comes back, you're the only one who can help us solve these problems. Marvy swallowed hard. Mm. He knew that since he'd put off studying math, he might not be able to solve the problems. But his friends were depending on him. Okay, I'll help. Three cheers for Marvy! Hurrah! 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 Uh, that's four, guys. Looks like we've got the right man on the job. So, what do we do, Marvy? Well, you have 900 head of doggies. Uh-huh. And 75 corral. I guess the answer is... is... uh... Yes? Yes? Uh, 97 per corral? Brilliant! Just brilliant! Well, of course, he's a schoolboy! All right, Sven, 97 per corral. Head them up and move them out. <laughs> with a huge yell, Sven and the others started filling the corrals with doggies. Marvy followed Carl and Olaf to the cook shack, where Bert the cook told them, There's yeah, 75 of us, Marvy, and we each get two slices of French bread with delightful cheese sauce. So how many do I make? Uh, how about, uh, 97? How do you do it? 97 it is, then. Amazing, Marvy. Simply amazing. Well, the boy's been to school. What, do you think he didn't study? Bert immediately started baking as Marvy and the others rode out to the eggplant cellar where Lars presented his problem. The best place to keep the eggplant cool is 75 feet down, Marvy. Besides, if we go any further than that, we'll poke a hole in the bottom of the island and start to sink. Now, each shovelful takes us down two feet. So, how many shovels full will it take to reach 75 feet? Why, 97, of course. Marvy. They all left Lars digging the well and rode slowly back to the ranch house. Marvy felt very satisfied with himself. He thought, Everything is going great. I knew I didn't have to study math to be a cowboy. They got to the ranch house just as Bert rang the lunch bell. Come in, get it! Dozens of hungry Razzleflabbins poured into the house and started devouring the French bread with delightful cheese sauce. 
Marvy smiled. And then it happened. One of the Razzleflabbins yelled out. Hey, I only got one piece. I didn't get any. What's going on, Bert? I don't know. Uh, I just made what Marvy told me. Suddenly, Sven ran up in a panic and shouted. Hey, everybody, the doggies are loose. There was too many of them in the corrals. The rails couldn't hold them. But that's impossible. Marvy told us exactly how many to put in each corral. What gives, Marvy? Uh, well, I guess I gave you the wrong answers. But if you gave us the wrong answer about the doggies... And you gave us the wrong answer about the French bread with delightful cheese sauce... Lars! Uh-oh. Oh, they all oh, raced oh, back to Lars in the eggplant cellar as fast as they could. Stop! But it was too late. There was a loud crack and a low rumble. And suddenly Lars shot up out of the hole, bouncing around at the top of a gusher of water. Just then, all the Razzleflabbins heard a huge bubbling sound and felt the island shake. We're sinking! This is the worst day of my life! Razzleflabbin Island is sinking to the bottom of the ocean and it's all my fault! What can we do? Uh, let's see, Marvy. If we have six shovels and the hole is 97 feet deep... What are you asking him for? Oh, uh, right. Sorry. Everyone grab a shovel! Dig for your lives! Marvy, Carl, and Olaf instantly grabbed shovels and started filling the hole with dirt as fast as they could. Hang on, Lars! Don't worry about him! He's all the way up there! We're ankle-deep in water down here! Keep filling in the hole! Oh, hurry up, you guys! They worked furiously, and slowly, with each shovelful, the gush of water grew a little less powerful. Until finally, it stopped completely, and Lars Whoa. fell to the ground. <coughs> Excuse me. Gradually, the island began to float back up to its normal level. Carl and Olaf turned to Marvy. How could this happen, Marvy? You went to school. You studied math. Marvy looked down at his feet sheepishly. No. No, I didn't study math. I kept putting it off. Then where did you get those answers? I made them up. Sorry, guys. Oh, Marvy, it's okay. We've actually come to expect this from you. Yeah, it'd be kind of disappointing if you didn't do something like this. You add a lot of excitement to our lives. But that still doesn't solve our problems. No, since Cal isn't here, and you don't have the right answers, then where are we supposed to get them? They all thought hard. Suddenly, Marvy remembered something. Hey, I know where! Marvy ran back to his bed on the beach, and there on the top of the covers was his math book. Ha! Come to Papa! Marvy raced back to the others. They cracked open the book and, after a little while, learned how to get the right answers. 900 doggies divided by 75 corrals is... Um, uh, 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 12 doggies per corral! And, let's see, 75 razzleflavins times 2 slices of French bread is... Let's see, carry the one... 150 slices. It's 75 feet divided by 2 equals... 37 and one half shovels full. Come on, everyone. Let's get to work. They spent the rest of the afternoon happily and busily repairing corrals, rounding up doggies, and digging an eggplant cellar. And afterwards, they all sat down to a wonderful snack of French bread with a delightful cheese sauce. Exactly. Two slices apiece. No more, no less. Finally, the sun started going down. So the Razzleflamins walked Marvy back to his bed on the beach. And as he climbed up onto his bed, Marvy told them... You know, I think I've realized a couple of things. One... Everyone, even cowboys, use math. And two, when I have a job to do, I should do it right away and not put it off. That's great, Marty. Uh, just one thing. Uh, you think you could realize it a little sooner next time? <laughs> I'll try. They all said goodbye to each other. Bye, Marty! Bye! Then Marty laid his head down on his pillow and drifted off to sleep as a gentle wave carried him out to sea. When Marty woke up, he was back in his bedroom. A clock on his desk told him only a few minutes had passed. And the first thing he did, and I mean the very first thing, was study for his math test. Thanks for joining us for Laugh and Learn. Hope you come back again soon for more fun with Joe with Jam and the Rattleflabbit. Bye-bye!